statements this morning. These committee and remind members that the meeting is being recorded and that the recording will be made available on the Hopkins Regional Council website following the meeting this morning. Also remind all present that local government decision making affords no protection to elected members, council officers and the public for comments made during the meetings that are subject challenged in a court of law and determined to be so on that right note, team, we will get into our meeting. And we'll start with our uh, agenda item one. Uh, yes, it's on. Mayor David. Thank you, can I move up? So moved by Councillor Councillor Campbell, by the second book, yes. And then, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Thank you again. Aye. Any more agenda items moved? Public forum. None advised. We have no public forum. We'll move on to, please, agenda item three. It is not on the agenda. We have none advised. Thank you. What's on the agenda? Civil Defence Emergency Management Joint Committee Minutes. Back on the 16th of December 2022, pages 7 to 11 of our agenda. This is a rising committee. Great and perfect as they are. Thank you Gee, I don't yes. have any. I'm happy to move them if the tenants are worth there. Moved by Councillor Mayor Dina. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. And those against, the item is carried. Moving on, please, to agenda item 7.1 correspondence. The Honourable Minister Nakamalti, Minister of Emergency Management, pages 12. Through to 15, his attachments. Thank you, Chair. Um, that's just correspondence that uh, Mayor Palin addressed to the Minister as Chair, advising the Minister of this forum being constituted last year and of the Chair Deputy Chair. And that correspondence is in the records and then the Minister's reply acknowledging and looking forward to working with. We have a recommendation for the report to be received. I have a move and move to the Chief Mayor in it. Second, the Chief Mayor Kaibong. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Those against, the item is carried. Moving on, please, to agenda item 7.2, pages 16 to 21, including attachments. Bay of Plenty 7, Group 2223 Annual Plan Dashboard as at the 22nd of March, 2023. Director Nadei. Thank you, Chair. Um, 
Just to remind members, this is just a high level snapshot of progress on the annual plan from all relevant councils, <coughs> including our team. And that I take it that your staff have briefed you on progresses of your individual work programs. However, I would just like to uh, provide, a, in my view, a word of caution here because the dashboard looks nice and green, but we've been through quite a bit in the last two months all the staff, etc. So we're gonna, I expect to see a bit of a, a lag in terms of some of the program that we delayed or stalled because of staff having been engaged in all these responses. So while I, this is sort of reporting historically where we're coming to, I think the reality might show us having to adjust work programs going forward. And we will bring that information to you the next time. Uh, thank you, um, Your Worship, and thank you, Clinton. Um, just kind of being new to the committee, I was wondering how the success stories or the information gets collated on there, because I see that Fakatani is blank, but I have to do these things to report. So does it come through from staff to populate this, or do we bring it to the meeting when we come? Yes, um, for clarification, this dashboard and reporting goes through three sets. So uh, committees before this one. Oh. So the uh, according to the executive group local authority subcommittee, which is your respective general managers, uh, are the first ones and staff report through that. Uh, and that's where we get the data from. That's then progressed to the according to executive group where the chief executives are. And that goes up and then it comes to you. So it starts with your staff reporting the success stories and giving us the progress on your respective councils. And that comes up through the channel. So I would expect that all that success stories you're aware of are addressed at each level as they come up. Is it okay if I share with what I've got and you can tell me whether it's appropriate for this or not, or whether the staff have perhaps elevated it? So, like for example, you know, we've got half a dozen cert teams that were ready, or and some of them stood themselves up during the recent event. And I would have thought um, you're aware of a CERT community emergency response team, the local ones, you know, like Matatai, Chikim, Wahai, sort of thing. So is that an item that is worthy of reporting? I think it is worthy of reporting. And I think just for clarification, this is about the annual plan. So it's more aimed at the activities and success stories of what you've achieved in your annual mm -hmm. progress. But your CERT's commentary. Yes. It's definitely we'll talk a bit later after the responses. Those are the six stories that come out of the response. And we need to play that and raise that. So we do encourage your staff to go to put through that put reports. Any of your councils are welcome to table I put a report to this committee of what you Okay. One of the other ones is that we now have a new standing committee, which is the Environment, Energy and Resilience. And while it's starting as a Fakatani uh, based standing committee, we're hoping in the future that it will move to perhaps being the joint committee once we get established. So, again, is that something the staff would report or is, is it of value or interest? Definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it is. Okay. I think that you would know, in my career, this is a joint committee. It's, mm -hmm. The IT doesn't know everything happening mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. So, we, we put out the call for agenda items, we put out the call. So we, we then would require that your councils report okay. that. So you're welcome to have a report on the agenda and speak to it. Oh, right. Trying to raise it. Well, I suppose, but I'm just tangle it from the dashboard. Yes. Just, just trying to track the annual plan. Okay. But you, you're right. We can't lose sight of all the other activities. All right. And well, then the third one was is that the recent event, um, our EOC actually has got its own dedicated tow 2 v 3 team which is a Māori communication team. So while you have the chief executive dealing with the chief executives and the mayor dealing with the media, um, we've got our own Māori dedicated team. And I think that would be of value and interest. Um, and just if I can just ask Mike, Mike, this is the first time we're still here? Um, this is our Mike Avery, he's our assistant controller. So, so I see what you're saying is that the dashboard is matched against some annual plan objectives, but I was wondering where we did report other things. Yeah. Yeah. What what concerns me is is there there is still a bit of a disconnect between, um, but for region and for the territorials, um, and um, I know when 
Gabriel, for instance, were a little bit left in the in the dark, if you want to put it that way, um, and people were ringing uh, myself and, and Councillor Scott and Councillor Eady and, and, and Leader. Um, I think that's where we what we, you're saying, Councillor Emick, is, is that we need to have those discussions at this at this level here too, most important, so that otherwise um, we're running around starting to do our own thing and that shouldn't be happening. We should be in a co coordinated team that everyone knows what's going on. It's very well, easy, very well for, for staff to say, oh, well, you should know what's going on. I could challenge any staff to say, well, if you know what was going on last week in Kaurau, if you were there getting getting the hell shaken out of you, you wouldn't have not had a clue what was going on in Kaura. So that's why I'm just coming in. I'm not 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 blaming anybody, but I'm just saying there is a bit of a disconnect there and we can pat ourselves on the back and say all these great things that have happened over incidents, but um, we've got to I don't think we should be patting ourselves on it. We should be dusting ourselves off and waiting for the next one that's coming down the track at us. And and that's that will make a real strong team, um, particularly here and, and I'm not decrying anything in the west or in Rotorua, but in the eastern Bay of Plenty, um, big sparse distances, a um, lot of nasty creeks, and, and, and unless we're, and we're you know, working together, um, we'll start working in isolation. So, and I know that I've worked with a couple of councillors um, over the prior storm with Gabriel, and to be quite honest, we were, we were feeling a little bit isolated um, up in Mount Hay, for instance, and um, it was just just so frustrating, and um, we, we, you know, we got Wapatani staff on board, and, and and particularly regional council staff, and got them coordinated. And although I don't believe that that we've fixed the problem, um, but you know, it was was um, was quite quite stressful for the for the people involved. That's all. So I'd just like to just table that, and I think that this is where we've got a, a high end stuff rate. Right? But, you know, we've got to get right down to what, what, what uh, Council Emmett is talking about. Um, we all need to know what's going on, don't we? And it's um, and it's the same thing happened in in, uh, in Papamoa um, when Gabriel was coming. People, people didn't know what was going on. Um, all very well for us to say it at top end, but I think Councillor Scott will bring that up later on. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, we're hearing that, well, we appreciate that, that there are some statutory uh, legal accountability measures that ultimately, at the end of the day, particularly with events, Deputy Mayor Emmick, is the way in which our people feel uh, safer or at least uh, have some measure of understanding of what's been put in place. Those are the stories, because I, like you, I actually see a blank success story dashboard for COVID. I don't think. Hmm. Um, which may be read quite different. If anyone in our community would have picked it up and see absolutely no success stories, we then work with our teams to lift up those really rich stories to demonstrate that through the training, this is actually uh, the fruit of the data, which is a lot of the training. I just have one question. I couldn't forget all tales. What was ITF in the dashboard? I could see the INT in terms of incident management team, but the ITF transition, I just couldn't find <laughs> or figure out. Thank you, Chair. ITF stands for Integrated Training Framework. Um, it is a system that was built a number of years ago by CDM groups to try and build a training program that is consistent so that when we deploy staff from here to Bay and they walk in there, the training's the same, the systems are the same. For a long time, New Zealand wasn't joined up and we had trouble when stopping to other areas because they did things differently. So that's a particular training framework. We do, we have produced an acronym list here. <laughs> um, it was possible for people to, um, that to that will help you start teaching the language of this world. Appreciate that. That was the one acronym I just couldn't even say. <laughs> okay, so if you said that someone in Kaido was to pick this agenda up, um, that's a new name. Confident now of what it means. Thank you very much. Further comments, questions, recommendations? We do have a recommendation to receive the report. Both thank you. Season for 2023 annual plan dashboard as at 22nd of March. Do I have a move? Ms. Worship, Neodemia, do I have a second? 
Thank you, Mayor Kai Fong. Those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Those against, the item is carried, and we welcome as worship David Moore. Mm -hmm. Closing. Oh, I can see his worship. Good morning, Your Worship. <clears throat> Sorry, I don't have the best um, reception at home. We wish you all the best. It's, it's wonderful to have you join us here this morning. And we have Councillor Brooks here as well as Deputy Mayor Brown this morning, Your Worship. Thank you for joining us. Moving on, please, to pages 22 to 31 of our agenda. Agenda item 7.3, confirmation of voting to civil events emergency management coordinating executive group. It's quite enough for the 2022 25 triennium. Thank you, Chair. I'll just highlight from the report that this is, uh, addresses the coordinating executive group, or another acronym, calls it's called CAG. Um, and that's your level below this committee, which is your chief executives. They, at that committee, they are joined by senior leaders from emergency services, health, et cetera. And that committee is also a statutory body that makes executive decisions on CDM. So the report just highlights the fact, firstly, that following a local government election, and once the joint committee is established, the chair of the court executive group needs to be reappointed for a new chair appointed for three years. Uh, and that's done by this Chief Executives Forum for the Bay of Plenty. So all the Chief Executives uh, appointed by the Chair. And the report today acknowledges that Russell George has been appointed as Chair of the Executive Group for a further three years. So for the same sort of training period. So that's the Russell on this appointment. Uh, the three on that level. Great. And then the second uh, aspect to this report is for this committee to sign off on the amended terms of reference for that committee. And that mainly addresses a couple of key points. One is about that while they, the legislation mandates certain agencies or representation to be there, it does allow for the executive committee to co-opt members. And the executive committee has endorsed to co-opt EV representatives. So first portion is, we haven't yet got the, the representatives, but the terms of reference have been amended to allow for EV groups on that executive group. The second one was to co opt and invite the chair of the regional leaders group to be part of that executive group. Um, that's another regional forum of uh, EV central government agencies, except for regional leaders, to have a CEA to join up the two regional forums. Um, the third one is rescind authority for some members that were co opted, and that was because historically they were outside personnel, such as the chair of the welfare coordinating group and recovery manager. Those functions are now performed in and by regional, uh, by emergency management, by a plenty. So I sit there as a representative for those functions. And then the last one was just to remove reference to district health boards. As everyone knows, they were just established at the end of June last year. So while we still have health representation uh, and we are waiting on health to advise us what that final representation will look like, it's just to remove the reference to an outdated system. So, in short, the report is there to acknowledge and well, congratulate Russell on this appointment and to pass for this committee to update it. How do you propose to select or um, access an EWI representative for the area? So that's the executive group. We have uh, Tupuni Kokri as members of that group. So we've been, uh, we have asked Tupuni Kokri to help us navigate and work through that with our EWI advisors and Stace Tohi from our team working with respective local councils. We're going to be looking at how that would happen. How do we have someone at that sort of regional executive level? So, Short answers, we don't have answer yet. Good luck. <laughs> well, we have acknowledged we need to uh, for that work to be done. Uh, Gee, a couple of things there. Stacey is a better person to be able to do that on the ground rather than having to pull a company butting in in North Wellington. That's just my opinion. The other thing is that these the background of these people that will be uh, on this list on page 23 from A to B to E, or A to E, sorry, and then two. 
Can we have some sort of feedback when that's all finalised that who those people actually are? Good luck with health. I say that with tongue in cheek. Um, but yeah. Um, but um, I think it's important that we, we around the table have some sort of idea who we're talking about too. But um, I, 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 I along with Councillor Scott, I don't think there should be a, uh, an Erie representative for the whole of the Bay of Plenty. It should be um, Eastern Bay and, and our receptive Iwi that we should be talking to. That's just my personal opinion because we know that there's a whole lot of diverse matters as far as Murray politics go. Um, but they are so important, uh, and I know um, my friend Councillor Brooks brought up the just a while ago with me, and, and we know through disasters that um, uh, iwi are going to play a huge role because of their marae-based um, uh, facilities that they do have, and it's so important, but you've got to be a bit careful of getting into the politics of that too. So just my, it's just my opinion. Thank you. Yes, we will share that and I'll send out a, a correspondence to this committee advising who the actual members are. Okay, the point. This is just agencies. Yeah. So we'll give you who the actual members are representing. That would be brilliant. Thank you. Um, and then fully support and understand the, the challenge that we have when you're trying to define a representative, especially for EWI or EWI. And that's why I've got stays working on that to try and look at how we do that. I think it's a challenge that we're having with the emergency management system in terms of totality. The new bill that's pending before government talks about now mandating that there will be representatives on this committee, yeah. um, for example. And, but again, the question is how, how will that be achieved? So that I would say we're all working through, not just this group, a lot of all the groups around the country are trying to work at. How does that work at the higher levels? Because the relationships actually are on the ground. So if someone does have the answer, we would welcome, but we are taking the challenge on. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you might, my point is also about EV representation, um, because this document, besides two words out of the whole document saying EV representatives, uh, leads it to kind of think they're not really being considered. In terms of who the representatives would be, most of the councils have a Māori advisor. You have this neutral person who talks to us about tikanga and protocol and also has networks. Would it not be easier to um, approve something that councils app appoint their Māori advisor with the, with the council representative, whether it's a chief executive or as a starting point? And then if something could happen, at least we've actually got something up and running rather than waiting six months for every council to go through and talk amongst their email about who the representative should be. With the Chief's permission, I'd like to invite Stace Tady to just come forward and give us a quick brief of where we've got to with this, because pretty much what you're describing mm. is exactly the model, mm. um, the wider system model is presented. <laughs> Koto, um, sorry, Mia. Uh, do you mind repeating the question? Oh, I was just <laughs> thinking my, most councils, in terms of who the EB representative might be, rather than having an elongated process of trying to determine who it is, most councils, um, I understand, have a multicultural advisor of sorts that talk to them either about tikanga, um, um, relationships with different iwi, and you know, what to say, how to say it, sort of thing. So, in the short term, would it not be easier to have them connected to each council as the EB representative until um, another method might be able to determine? Okay, Pamela. I think um, so. It's a it's a tricky path, as I'm sure you're aware. Um, and I think one of the big pitfalls that that might come from something like that is, I mean, if you can have EB say that this person can talk on behalf of EB. Impact of pie, but that's generally not the case um, <laughs> because um, iwi representation is exactly that it's the iwi representative for the iwi speaking on behalf of their iwi representing hapu and whanau from that rohi. Um, and that, that in itself is where where we 
uh, trying to navigate. And so what Clinton was referring to before was um, a piece of work that we've been looking at doing, which is going to require us to, um, and what I'll do just quickly is I'll just put into context how, how we do our mahi with your council. So um, I work with Justin, Paul Tayua, who's part of the team, um, and again with uh, with Kawero and the region. So we work with and through your emergency management officers to engage with your, not your iwi, but the iwi of your rohi. So that's, um, it's, first of all, not overly taxing, because we already know there's a capability and a capacity issue. Um, and then secondly, we do that so that everything we do is in line with the group and how we do it. And so one of the things and pieces of work that we've been looking at is continuing some work that we've seen happen in the Hawke's Bay and down through um, Tairawhiti, and that is with <coughs> some of the uh, work around containers and so on and so forth. The only way we are going to make that happen is having full proper end representation. And what we've been looking at is pulling together a, an iwi Māori Emergency Management Board. That is, and that word, please, that, that is not the name that we'll go with, but, but just, just to give it a bit of context. Um, and, and the idea behind that will be um, looking at having iwi sitting around a table. Um, emergency Management will be sitting at that table, mana kita mana, so it will likely be Clinton, um, but Clinton won't be chairing it. So it will be chaired by whoever they choose to chair. And with that, we will work through that process. Now, what that will do is we'll create an opportunity where iwi can say who they want to represent. And then they can come up with how they want to represent and what that will look like in terms of representation. Because the one thing that we need to remember with emergency management, yes, it's very relevant to us, it's very relevant to what we do, but it's about that much of their money when it comes to everything that they have on. And that's one thing that we've realized over the last four years engaging in this space. And um, it's, it's about not overburdening but also capitalising on the matauranga and the other ways of knowledge that, and, and taking that co-op and work with it. So, quick question, Mia. Um, if you could have a Māori advisor that was um, given the, the go-ahead to speak on behalf of iwi, then, then that may, may be a go, but I imagine that would be something that you would have to discuss um, as, as governance and look out what that would look like. Just a yeah. supplementary. Yeah, thank you, Stace. Um, first of all, thank you for elevating me to the role of me. Um, <laughs> in terms of having like an EU body management group, the skill set required in an emergency is quite, from a leadership point of view, is quite different from a political set of skills. So that would obviously be taken into consideration. So it's someone who's very responsive, someone with wide network, someone that when you pick up the phone, actions happen. Yes, yes, yeah. and 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 we and we we already know that iwi um, already sort of have those connections. And one of the one of the big things that we've worked out is, you know, with regards to the training that we're building, um, with regards to how this works, we're no longer trying to change what Māori do. Māori already have an emergency management network. They call it tangihanga, okay? Uh, something happens uh, at a, that they weren't aware was going to happen. They have to come together because they're going to support, feed, um, and, and respond to a bunch of different things for about you know, 100 odd people that are going to turn up in three days and they're going to have to house those people. All you do is you take out the tangihanga and you put in an event and it's the same process. So it's about fitting into their system. It's about using the mātauranga of their systems to work at that level. And that's the hapu whānau level. So that's where we're, we're really digging in at the moment. And then as you say, um, when we look at iwi, that brings it and elevates it up into that strategic level. And that's the strategic level that we want to be holding um, sort of at this group office level. Um, so we're not overriding what's sort of happening with local, but it all needs to tie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll just look to our Zoom colleagues and see if there's any comments or questions. Thank you for sharing that work. It has absolutely been a challenging part, 
May seem functionary, but when that function disappears and we, we soon learn how really important that is. Um, Thank you. Thank Page 22 of the agenda. Okay, nice the very well. Thanks much for the discussion. Recommendations three. Report we received. Confirmation of the Bay Plenty. Uh, as it can be approved, which means to 25. Congratulate. See, you know, St. George, in particular, as the chair of the Bay Plenty Senior Defense Management Coordinating Executive Group. And three, approved the amended Bay Plenty Defense Management Coordinating Executive group in terms of reference. Do I have a reason? So moved by Councillor Campbell. Do I have a second? A second of the Deputy Mayor Clifford. All those in favour? Yes, I have. The item is carried. Moving on to please pages 32 to 35 of our agenda. We've got item 7.4 Bay Plenty Soil Defence Emergency Management Group Plan Development. Twenty twenty three to twenty twenty eight. Thank you, Chair. And, and just introducing Cora Gordon, Principal Advisor from Emergency Management in our office. Cora is leading this piece of work, and um, I'll hand over to her to take you through. You'll take it as read, but you'll identify some key points around the development of the plan. Thanks, Cora. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Clinton. Morena Tato. Yeah. Um, as Clinton said, I'll take this report as a read. However, I will talk through a number of key points um, that I'd like to raise with you. As you're all aware, and as I spoke to you about at the December Joint Committee meeting, our intention had been to provide this committee meeting today with the draft group plan. However, due to operational requirements over the last number of months and staff commitment, both to responses within the Bay of Plenty and deployments to our um, surrounding regions and our neighbours, we have had to delay that process. However, it does not mean we're requesting an extension on the group plan because we've been able to find other uh, safe time savings throughout the sign-off process. So we're still working to deliver this group plan by the end of this year. We're currently at a stage of pulling together feedback from your staff across your councils and pulling together the final draft of that document to run through the subcommittees that sit in under this meeting and then through to the coordinating executive group. The intention was then that we will request this committee signs this plan off for public consultation at your next meeting. However, before we do that, we have coordinated a meeting or a workshop, sorry, with the members, which is being held on the, sorry, the 16th of June, and Miranda has kindly worked with your teams around that scheduling. So what we'll do at that point is bring this uh, committee back together in a workshop forum, and we'll have a three-hour period set aside where we can work through the detail of that plan, work through any questions that you have, make any changes or revisions depending on what feedback you receive. We'll ensure that you have the draft copy of that plan well in advance so that you can have a read through and seek any, uh, any advice that you need from your councils and your teams. We've also ensured that we've built enough time into the sign-off process for you to put it through your councils if you would choose to do so, as I know Kawaro have requested. So that's the primary update I'd like to give. If anyone has any questions, I'm happy to take them. Yeah, I, um, I circulated a, uh, uh, some information about a particular product, and I don't want to get a into a position of being a salesperson for a product, because <laughs> I'm not. But um, I think what I'm interested in is what are the learnings we have had from recent events. Um, so we know that um, relying on electricity is dangerous, relying on cell phone networks is dangerous. Um, there are um, also issues around alerts that are stop go or read green if you like 
um, because people don't understand necessarily how uh, in a range of responses they could do where it fits. So is this a drill? Is this um, a bit of water around the bottom paddock? Or is this going to be built up to my eaves? So there's that nuance of that information. So what I liked about that product was that it did allow information to be there. Is this a tsunami warning? Is this a flood warning? Is this a earthquake response that required? Is this um, the need for a lockdown because there's someone with a gun nearby? Those, what does this alert, whatever we're hearing, have to deal with? Um, as I say, it, it allows um, the system to work when we're not relying on electricity. Um, works in remote areas. Uh, I was involved with, uh, so my interest, I have uh, an involvement with a disability organisation. The people who we support, if their routine gets changed, um, that's it, they're climbing up the walls for the next uh, literally three, four weeks. So is this, a, is this emergency, if it's a siren, is this emergency something that we have to react to now? Can we wait? Um, so that sort of nuanced information is important. I was also involved with a school in Papamoa. It was just a drill. Um, but parents were coming to pick up their kids against the flow of where they should have been going. So that, as part of the plan, is what um, products are out there or what, what opportunities are out there to make sure that we can address the sort of problems we saw in Hawke's Bay about whether or not how serious this was, what do we do, do we know that help's coming, all those sorts of questions. So as part of the plan, I think it's important to investigate what options are there and there may be complementary options. It doesn't have to be one or another. So I just find that's a really important aspect of whatever you do in your, in your planning. Fantastic. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I, I, look, I'd like to, to sort of back up what Councillor uh, Scott's saying. The, the, the thing for me is that it, it appears with, with what's in the media, but also what's what's ex personal experience, that the lessons learned are not being implemented. Um, from my personal experience, I know full well that communication is out as soon as an, a, an event occurs, also power. So any report needs to look at infrastructure in relation to that. It also needs to, to look at uh, communication, which is the biggest key, um, and how how things are going to uh, move along. Um, and when we have two scenarios, I mean, you have a planned event, which is like Gabriel, we all knew, was coming. Um, and I, and I actually thought that people sat on their hands a little bit in relation to what it was. Some was really, really good. Um, and then we have unplanned ones like the Edge Come Earthquake, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the thing for me is that uh, we can all sit there and pat each other on the back and say we did this really, really well. Um, but I don't think that we're actually learning anything from this. And local knowledge is one of the best things that we can ever have in emergency management. But our system is one of, to our advantage in, in the Eastern Bay, especially. Um, and those are the sorts of things that we need to be putting forward as options and saying this is, this is, because you're never going to mitigate all risk. But, you know, there are simple steps that we could do utilise the, the, the uh, resources we have to our best effect. And I don't think that's necessarily been happening in the past um, until after the event because local people would just get on with things themselves. And I think that's one of the things that any consideration for report or planning needs to look at those aspects, communication, certainly infrastructure and power, because it's not if, it's when. Get it. And that's one of the things I think we need to look at as a, as a priority. Thank you, 
Okay. Um, so there's a number of points I'd like to make in response. And first of all, I'd like to acknowledge both of your comments. I absolutely agree with what you're saying, particularly around the role of communications in terms of enabling our response capability and the strength that our communities bring and getting on with um, dealing with what's in front of them. In terms of the group plan, this is our strategic document. It's our five-year equivalent of a long-term plan that looks to where we need to be in the future. Um, that plan includes things like looking to a strategy to ensure that we are um, looking to resilient communications and the like. And it also allows us to link in with council long-term planning processes to make sure that we're not withholding and resources available to everyone. However, in the shorter term, because that group plan won't be published until the end of this year, and therefore we won't be picking off the, uh, the work to deliver it, the points that you're making are what we need to be dealing with now. We need to be looking at the lessons out of those emergencies that have happened in the, in the last few months, and also the ones that happened before then. And that's part of our standard process. So we are working through a debriefing process at the moment, and we have an external provider coming in who is doing a, a, a look through what happened to ensure that we've got those lessons learned to the front, and also the experiences of our neighbours in Tairapati and Hawke's Bay, particularly around communications. I was one of the team that deployed into Tairapati and learned firsthand the challenges of a response. We don't have those communications in place and trying to bring everything together. So the ability to learn lessons from those uh, types of responses is absolutely critical to what we do and we do have a standard lessons learned process that we go through in order to uh, in order to bring those into the way we operate. We are already making changes um, in terms of some of our response plans and some of it's simple things such as working with our agencies on pre-agreed actions. So if we can't talk to you this is what we both know the other half is going to do. And the simple way I like to describe it is if we've got two roads that need opening and we can't talk to each other and one person's opening road A and the other person's opening road B, you do twice the amount of work. Whereas if we can have a pre-agreed thing, we we're all opening road A, you can half the work that's required. So that's the type of approach we take in order to ensure that when communications fail, because unfortunately they will, we're able to still respond, but also working with our lifeline utilities providers to ensure that we can bring those communications up as soon as possible and making sure we've got as many resilient layers of warnings to our public in place as we possibly can. And as new, new technology comes into, um, into being, we're able to leverage that. Clinton, would you like to add anything else? Thanks, Cora. I think you summarised it. The key thing, fully agree. All these events teach us lessons. Mm -hmm. They're only lessons that we learn from them and then do something about them, mm -hmm. not just the list. Mm -hmm. So we had, do have a paper about the Cyclone Gabriel response, mm -hmm. uh, where I was going to talk a bit more about, so what do we do? What's, what's next? But in short, yes, we are learning. We are reviewing. We're also reviewing with our partner. So Hawke's Bay will be learning looking at their lessons. Sarafati, Auckland, Coromandel. This was a very massive event, and there's learnings all over that we need to collate. We, we had the advantage of learning, having people like most of my team here went into different areas, <coughs> Gisborne, Wairoa, Napier, etc. So we got first-hand experience, but we also then got observations. We got the stuff we hear from others and media. So we're collating all that to come up with how do we learn from this and what are then the priority things we want to address. Mm -hmm. and then the, um, so noting that this report is is a is an update on the progress of the plan rather than the plan itself. Mm -hmm. so we'll check that, um, that how, how tight is the um, timeline now and is it vulnerable to um, any other instance coming along from that? Any timeline is vulnerable to any other incidents in our world of emergency management. However, we have built uh, we have built some capacity in there to ensure that if things do shift and change, uh, we're able to to use my favourite word pivot. Um, the one issue would be if the 
the key meetings aren't able to go ahead because forums like this are hard to bring together outside of session. Uh, so that would be where the challenge would come in if we weren't able to have either a coordinating executive group or a joint committee at an expected time. However, we've managed to bring enough time into our, our schedule to be able to hopefully flex if that does happen, but a major event will always throw spanners in the works. And I'd also note that, of course, the, the, the recent law change means that Zoom could make that convening of meetings a lot easier now. So, uh, thank you. Yes, hopefully. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Cara. Um, I've got a bit more of a cynical view on this. To me, this looks like uh, a plan about having meetings, about having meetings. And um, while well, I read it's just an update on the plan and I'm you know, new to this committee, the, the learnings, we, don't, we can't wait till the end of the year to bring in all the learnings. We can't wait until the next major event to test the plan. I mean, I'd like to see this title, Emergency Group Plan, when you look at the executive summary, sets the strategy and direction for the next five years. If we change that to action and response plan for the group, it just sounds so much more tangible and like you can actually get some objectives and achievements out of it. This is a public document and it just reads like it, this is to keep people employed. That's my cynical view of it. I, I, just, I just can't see, even with the timeline you've got, how we know, what can we do today to make us better prepared for tomorrow? And it's not a strategy. I appreciate that strategies are there to attract funding. And when you have regional sort of strategies, you can get that, that input from external as well as councils, because all councils need to be able to have some justification for it. But it's not a critique of you, Cara, or you, Clinton. It's actually like, what are we here for if we're not there to make the community safer, faster? Yeah. Thank you, 100%. And I know when we're in the thick of it, believe me, when my team are in the thick of it, we're not looking at strategies. We're looking at how do we serve our people? How do we save them? It's where there's this hierarchy, unfortunately, and bureaucracy. We all live the same as local government. This plan is not our response plan. We have a response plan. And every council has response plans and we have standard operating procedures at the operational level. That's what your controllers are working to. The strategy document is a legal requirement like your long-term plan of your council where you collectively are telling the community, we are going to make the base safer and how do we think it's going to happen over the next five years? You're quite right, it is a funding document. Because at the end of the day, everything we try and do costs money. But are we joining up? Are we doing it smart? So it's the strategy that overarchingly sits. And then below that is our annual plan that we talked about earlier. Every year, what are we doing to achieve that five-year vision? But below that, there are definitely response and operational plans that get amended fast and quick to your local controllers, our regional controllers, our staff. So they are learning fast, and we don't wait with some things that lessons will come back to this committee and then I'll be quite blunt because normally those are the ones when I'm going to come back and say we need some money mm. or resourcing to make it happen. Mm. We'll fix the stuff on the fly or at our level that's within just like you run with your council so if it's a big ticket item we need your input we need your sign off and okay so it's the it's the governance level this is the operational level and, and I think what you're saying is you want to see more of that and that we can work on for you. That's a supplementary. I'll talk to Walter. So there must be other councils and groups like this around the country with the recent events, all feeling very frustrated about the bureaucracy of all these strategies. I mean, is this a time now where we lift this up the line and just say, we have to make the bureaucracy less so they can get more actions, but rather than just accepting the status quo of the bureaucracy coming down at all levels and everyone's cross-checking and covering their own butts, you know, should this committee be a voice for actually trying to fix some change? Because the people on the street, the people that are still out of their houses, this is completely irrelevant. So I would like us as a group to actually make a bit more noise. I'm not sure who to direct that to. <laughs> 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 I 
Yeah. I'll just, uh, just going to apologise for Councillor Ariel Gill. She's a mother's daughter. Good on you. Well done. Yeah. Any response to the Arizona opportunity? Yeah. 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 In response, there is an opportunity to start to do that. We, as I spoke to at our last meeting, the Civil Defence Emergency Management Act is currently being reviewed. It is that act that sets the requirement for things like the group plan. Um, when we have the draft bill, which we are expecting at some point the first half of this year, we'll be able to provide it to this committee, and that is the type of feedback that if this committee would like to put through, that will be an opportunity to do so. I appreciate it's just my views so and plus any of others. Uh, no, I just, no, I just, I just, I mean, it's, it's all who we know do is what you're basically saying. And, um, and I actually quite agree. I mean, I think that what needs to be done is, is people need to know what's going on out there. And, and so really, if, if they need funding or they need something, um, one, who's going to pay and who's, where, how we're going to work it. But like there are certain things that we that should you would know. So let's what's what's your list, right? What's 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 you know? Let's get it done instead of talking here and coming back in June and whatever. Say the same. What what do you need? If you, if you need something, then we should be known about it so we can put some pressure on someone somewhere, you know, the food chain, whatever it happens to be, to get things done. And I think that we can sit on our hands and all talk about it. But let's. Let's get some actions going. And I agree, we need some action points to say, right, this, this is the list. How do we get it up there and who do we put pressure on? I'll defer to my boss on that one. No, I fully, fully appreciate that. Um, that's exactly what we work and strive with, and Russell knows as chair of the executive, that we put a lot of these reviews and recommendations to the different committees if it's operational matter it gets signed off it's done and then we'll bring stuff up to this committee where we need your input and then to use your language for this um, I would say that yes the list is coming but we do need to go to the executive the CEs to get direction from them on which way they want to go uh, because it's a collection of all your councils as well at the end of the day the, the workforce and the effort comes from all of us combined um, and it just such on your point at DPV was I need to start over bureaucracy. Martin, no, I'm, I'm a, I want to get on and do the, the job. But I'm also responsible for legal compliance. And at the moment, we are required, and every group is required to have the strategic plan. A lot of groups are going through the same, I would say, uh, challenges we are, um, and looking at well, why do we do this? What is the purpose of this? Are we just doing something for the sake of doing something? And Corporate Car is right. The new legislation that's coming is a unique opportunity to input back collectively back up to the national central government and say, look, this is the changes we want to see in our system. And I would emphasize it's not actually just about a document, it's about the system. How do we want the system to work faster, quicker, and more effectively in joining it? It's just unfortunate the national agency is really busy much here. Councillor Scott. Thank you. Um, this is also an opportunity for our MPs across the region to work on our behalf in the advocacy mode. They've all been around, they've done the phone calls, they've been have their photographs taken at the emergency spots, shaking hands, you know, um, being very empathetic. We actually need them to be working for their money. We need them to be really elevating this the whole way, particularly with the changes that are coming. And that's still not going to make it quick enough for us, but um, I've, I, do they receive minutes from here? Do we write to them and say, this is the feeling of the group or what are you hearing on the ground with other you know, councils or groups? Like, we need to really be working hard on this. Yeah. I do or differently. Yeah, yeah uh, maybe uh, to the chair, I could propose it. It was a point where this committee had invited the Minister for Emergency Management to come visit. And unfortunately, circumstances require that he couldn't make it. But we have a standing offer back from his office to say if this committee would like him to come back. So maybe that's a, a, an avenue is for us to have the minister come talk to us, and then this committee can talk to the minister around what your concerns are around emergency management. But also our local MPs. Yeah, we've, we've probably got about eight of them across the region. Thank you. 
I'm probably following on to that. There's, as, as you mentioned, there's a lot of changes legislatively in the local government, local authority sort of area. Um, what's your advice, Clinton, in terms of this um, subject matter is, is the best form of input through our local councils or each of our councils, or is there something which this committee should, if we're making submissions or if we're trying to make a um, make a point anywhere, where, would, where do you think would be the, the heaviest hit? Uh, to the Chief. Councillor, very good question. My mark for you as well. Uh, because there are always going to be the power of this collective if it's around specifically under the CD the emergency management issues. The bond joint committee submissions are powerful. But then the access and its members and all individual members. So if we could get that there's instead of just one submission from the pay from the committee, there's eight the committee plus the individual councils and they are in ministry. I think that's one of the biggest challenges, making sure we are in step with each other. Nothing's worse than getting submissions that one agrees, one doesn't agree. So short answer to that is both avenues I would encourage both the individual and collective that support each other. So bearing in their mind, is it have you got the capability or the resources to, to bring us a document which ties in this, because there's so many bits of legislation that are changing that would, would help us form some sort of coherent emergency management submission? Sure answer is we always do it more, but and looking at Cora, she's that's her role as principal advisor, is she's on top of the legislative changes. She is focused at the moment on the emerge, direct emergency management act and will. The national plan, and that definitely will be coming here for a joint submission. Uh, she works with all the councils as well to make sure we are joined up. There are other legislation pieces that influence say that. That's what that yeah. So, Cora is connected in with local government planners, and there's a, a there's even a forum that's been established where we're sharing knowledge to try and unpick sometimes what, if a change is happening in the RMA, what does that mean for emergency management? And when Cora picks up that, that will be brought back here as well. So it's it's a bit of a it's a, that legal complex game of some things sit in this lane, other things overlap the lane. So, so many changes. Thank you, councillors. Uh, very good discussion. Um, I'm going to ask Councillor
not um, disputing the fact that review is needed, but the beauty of the fact that actually four or five reforms all at the same time is probably not. It's really huge, and it's going to harm some of the communities to be able to get yeah. through. There's no councils being able to put a more substantial submission. So we do have <laughs> back on a page. Page 32, a recommendation. Really, to receive the report. I wonder, committee, if there are any additional recommendations we would like to add to that. I'm looking to get in there and make. Um, given the substantial discussion we've just had, there is an opportunity to have some recommendations added to that, I believe, to convey the urgency, the messages, the conversation we've just had. No, I thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I think uh, perhaps one of the recommendation is to not use the word engage, but to have active communication with our local MPs and invite the minister to come and attend a future meeting rather than I'll let uh, Marinda phrase that beautifully. <laughs> <laughs> and the the other one, possibly, you're right with that one, Marinda. Yep. Um, the other one is actually to add perhaps where it says strategy and direction, perhaps add strategy, direction leading to action plans, something like that. So it keeps us accountable, considering this is a public document, because otherwise they'll just think it's more words about words. I'm not sure how to phrase all of that, whether that becomes a recommendation or just what would help us get funding from central government? What would look good for councils if the request comes for more funding? Yeah, put some action points in there. Action points. Um, and I'm just picking up the gentleman's thoughts about uh, learnings, right. report reporting. I know this is a strategy which doesn't normally have the actions and the reporting back, but we want the plan to be a circular plan rather than straight across. Sorry, I'm just wanting to clarify. Is this now for the argument now? The committee will have the opportunity to be independent. We have power to the draft. We'd love the minutes to actually just reflect uh, discussion. the discussion yeah. that's being held. Otherwise, it will just be there. It was received yeah. and received only. So that's really what we've been doing. Sure, sure. So, so why don't we add something like um, to ex um, team staff to, um, to consider lessons from in their ongoing um, development of the annual plan, rather than the annual time. Adjust and get the plan. Yeah, no, I agree. We don't want it just to read it. We've received the report. And you can use robust language too, Marinda, if you like. You know, like to reflect the because so often when you read council reports, it says the discussion was held about the veracity of you know the funding or something, rather than the, that you know there was um, good discussion amongst all representatives about us having a stronger position and uplifting advocacy with our MPs, and that doesn't have to be a recommendation. That's just reflection. Well, it's just a minute, it's rather recommendation. Do you want to move back to recommendation? <laughs> That's right. <laughs>
see that? Yes. Let me highlight all the concerns raised as part of the discussion of all these. So I'll potentially agree to Dulex. 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 Dulex staff. And then I think that the first incorporation needs to come out. So Dulex staff consider the lessons learned for incorporation. So lessons learned from recent events. And with point three, sorry, through the chair, the not engage around the act of communication um, isn't, isn't quite right. Maybe um, to direct, uh, do we want to write a letter to our MPs and to the minister reflecting the, the tone and the intention of the meeting? And, and to invite all. Um, yeah, you know, instead of having that uh, incorporation during the development of the draft plan, it should be incorporation into the draft plan. So we actually want the thing done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Please, again, incorporation. Please, sorry, come to the box. So, so, so direct staff to recommendation the, to yeah, direct staff from to the consider. beginning. Direct staff to consider. Yeah, consideration lessons learned from recent events. Uh, for incorporation into the development of the plan, rather during. Action point B. And maybe the third one is to write and invite. So if it becomes an official letter, they, they have to have that loaded through their correspondence. And it gives us something tangible as well. Um, the reason we want to invite them and meet with them is that with the recent changes coming up in the legislation, we want to look at how can we simplify the bureaucracy. So that's more for what's going to be in the letter, maybe. Commissioner Tolley, you're Um, good morning and thanks, um, Chair. No, look, I, I think you've answered, I think uh, the, the, the rehash of that, because uh, I was just looking at the agenda item is really, we have to do a strategic plan, even if the legislation changes, we'll still have to do a strategic plan uh, for the next five years, I'm sure. Um, and we wouldn't want not to do that. I understand some of the frustration that's being expressed, but I was just concerned as to what we're actually asking our, our MPs and our and our minister to attend a meeting to discuss. Uh, I think if you give them something specific, you're more likely to get them to want to come and talk about it, and they will certainly, certainly the upcoming legislation is 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 the, the key. I think rather than just coming and discussing how frustrated we might be that we have to do a strategic plan and what we really want to be talking about is a much more joined up action plan. Um, so I think I think we're getting there with the um, with the recommendations and I agree with James's um, uh, change to um, to number two to to incorporate those lessons learned from Tidafati and Hawke's Bay into that um, development of the draft and and I think the timeline that the staff have outlined is sensible um, and and happy happy to support the recommendations. Thank you, Commissioner. I think we're there. Yes. 
So moved. Yes. Moved by Second. I'm happy to second. I just was going to do the upcoming legislative opportunities coming up or upcoming legislative changes. Is it saying concerns regarding is it about the current mm -hmm. or that we want the opportunity with it coming up? Pending. There we go. It's a better upcoming word. Move. Upcoming segment. <laughs> all, those, all those in favour, just say aye. All right. Just say aye. 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 Item agenda, agenda item 7.5, pay attention to civil offence and emergency management group tsunami ready program update. Thank you, Chair. Um, again, just a reminder that this is a priority program that we collectively be working on, and we have a standing committee as the other committees of the progress there, and I'm joined by Liz Oliver. City Advisor Emergency Management um, on loan from Taranga City Council to help us at the moment uh, on this piece of work and Stace Tahiti, the manager of planning in our team. So and to them to give you the update on where the program is at. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, so this is a program that's been going for a while now. So I'm sure a lot of people in the room are all over it at the moment, but I just wanted to highlight a couple of key priorities that are going on at the moment. So procurement process has now been completed through Bay of Plenty Regional Council and Emergency Management Bay of Plenty to undertake a regional comprehensive model for the whole base, um, Bay of Plenty coastline for tsunami. As we've highlighted previously, currently we have a wide variety of models across the Bay of Plenty, um, which has led to differences. We're now looking at doing one comprehensive model that will cover the whole coastline, fill in any gaps, and also provide us with the most up-to-date data so that we can be better prepared. Um, so that proposal has been issued, the request for proposal has been issued and we've received that proposal now. So we're just working through that um, and this piece of work is due to start in July. Uh, the other key piece I want to highlight is that the relevant report, so ECOS report that was commissioned through the Bay of Plenty Regional Council has now been received and finalised. Uh, this will be being released to the relevant councils early next week. And along with that will uh, be the finalised evacuation one blue zone maps uh, with this recent ECOS changes implemented and enveloped into those models. So we've seen those previously. Um, they will be going out to local authorities for the final sign off next week. So those are the key highlights. If there's any questions. questions. Um, the, the, I like the fact that there's one that's much simpler than one, one blue zone. Um, I'm aware, uh, once again, going back to, to schools in the Papamoa area where you move from one orange to yellow, whatever it was. Um, the, the big question becomes, uh, or two questions really, is how big an action is required in an event. So under the previous system, 100 metres up the road was enough. Under this system, move up to the hills. Um, and the, the question that comes before that is, is how is this, you know, what sort of communication have you had with those sort of schools or child poor centres, um, those sort of places? So that goes back to local authorities and their on-the-ground work with communities. So I know um, like TCC works very closely with the local Papamoa schools and residents there um, and helps them with their evacuation planning. Um, yes, I understand what you mean around the distance inland. Uh, the current reasoning moving away from those three zones was that whenever an evacuation notice is issued, it never says evacuate the red zone or the orange zone, it just says evacuate zones, um, safe locations. So it's just to make it simpler for communities, as you've highlighted, that sort of more technical on the ground planning is still with local authorities. So is that consistent amongst local authorities? Or is... 
through the chair, um, councillor, yes, that is. So um, what, what's happening is every um, council has their emergency management officer or emergency management team, um, and they are doing the active engagement in pieces uh, around that area. For example, um, Fakatani has Justin Douglas out here doing his mahi um, for Kaurau and for Portiki. It's Megan Edhouse, and she's out there meeting with all the schools and all the community engagement stuff. Um, and then same for Western Bay, you've got Joe. Um, so so we, we've got people out there. They are doing what they need to do. Sorry, I didn't mean to do either um, with, uh, uh, with Bruce and his team. But they are out there. They are talking with their communities. Um, and that is being conveyed through us and them and making it all, as you say, circular. Bring it all and we'd be aware of that because of that first item on the agenda today, which says things are in green. So that comes back. So I did um, the direct want to respond. Sorry, I can just add to the, the, the discussion there, picking up on schools. There's also another approach that we bring in just for awareness is our office is working with the Director of Education for Bay of Pinty. So we are going in from the, the Ministry of Education side to help standardise understanding in schools. And then, um, as they said, our office also produces a lot of the collateral, the templates, the communications. So Lisa last year has worked out a whole communications package, which is provided to the locals to go execute and deliver. So that's how we manage the consistency across our region. There still needs to be boots on the ground and it's delivered through the local, local staff. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Liz. I've got a couple of questions. So looking at the timeline board, um, so the, the zone maps and the boards will be ready for the 1st of June. Councils are all receiving the information about the tsunami zone maps imminently coming up in the next few weeks. So at the 1st of June, the tsunami boards are all going to be, and the education process that goes with it will all be done or in the process by that date. What about the on-the-ground stuff? So it's one thing is to have the tsunami board. Let's say we've got tsunami coming here. Where are we going up on the hill? What will you get when you get there? Is that what councils need to do between receiving the tsunami map zones and the maps boards? in the 1st of June. Like I'm just thinking there's almost, if we're going to have this education and we're going to have the boards, we need to actually make sure we've got the facilities to accommodate you know, bathrooms and water and whether that's containers or get logged around the district, wherever the evacuation zone is. Yes, um, I think that's, that's exactly how the comprehensive model works, is there's, they all interlinked, you're quite right. It's no good just saying, here's the zone, get out. We, do, we, we learned those lessons. And that's why the team have been working through this whole process. It's a, it's a project involving all your local staff as well. So they, although Liz is talking about official handover of reports, those reports have been available to all the staff. They've been working on it. So it's a collaborative effort. So your local staff will be working to identify where are those zones, what should be going into those zones. And that's the next level of how do we take care of the people that arrive there? So it's not... I would say it's, it shouldn't have been something that's just going to happen between now and first of June. That's stuff that's been planned already. So I would encourage you to talk to your local staff and ask them what is our plans to look after your communities when they arrive there. Thank you. Just supplementary, Madam Chair. Um, just, I mean, I think this is looking really good. You know, from the work that's been done from December to now, with well, the first of June launch is great. I'm just not sure whether our councils have got enough time to. Well, I'm not aware of us organising containers and all the other facilities that might need to go to the evacuation zone. So um, I don't know. Can I just ask our staff member, Monica, are you receiving information? Yes. So we have, as we've seen, working with the well, I guess this is the Fakatani thing. I'm on all the pre-agenda committees and I haven't seen an item like this coming yet. So thank you for raising that. Also, just to, to emphasise this, the blue maps don't change the message that's been there for years. That, you know, right. 
what it's actually doing is simplifying the confusion over three colors. Mm -hmm. Because Waikato, Wellington, us, we started to find out people get confused because when you say evacuate, they go, which, which color? So we try to take that second guessing out and everything and just going, if you're in blue, and there's some good slogans coming up, and I want to follow around those catchphrases to try and get that education across. But the message is still the same. We're not changing much about where they're going. So I would encourage you to have a discussion with your staff around. So what is the plan once people get out? Um, and then, as we said earlier, if there then there needs to be some joined up regional coordination of that, let's have a talk about it, bring it back here, the scale of economy, if you call it, and learn from each other. Sometimes there's a good idea done in a Pohiki that can be shared that Western Bay could learn from, etc. So that's what we're interested in is what does happen to it in reality. Thank you. You just, um, just, I'm, I'm a little bit behind April here. We're talking about blue line. Is this the inundation map that we were given last year? Um, it was quite confusing. You didn't know exactly where the shoreline was and where you actually situated. That was an issue. And, and a simple black line around where the shore has got to go, that's, that'll give you a bit of an idea. Um, has, has that actually been finished? Yes, you know, it incorporates Potiki because Mayor Esther was really concerned the fact that when we did that presentation, um, Potiki was not part of it. Um, that was a bit of a concern. Um, and so, yeah, it's just just so long as, and I think like um, Councillor Limick says, we, we all need to be aware of, of that within the territorials to know exactly what's going on. And the territorials need to say, well, we need to make some provision for um, uh, evacuations. And um, I know that um, Councillor um, Winters has talked about his visit to Tairawhiti last week, and I've talked to, to um, Councillor Brooks about it. There's some stuff that you can probably do a bit of overkill, but there's certain things that, that definitely need to be water and accommodation and if you are in a situation where it's raining for instance and generally <laughs> one follows the other um you know it's a whole lot of whole lot of questions that we really need to be doing and and it's important that um, places like Kawarau and Rotorua are well and truly in, in, in sync because they could be uh, refugee centers um, and that's what we found with the last the last one anyway and, and, and they were woefully ready at the time, wasn't for the deputy mayor of the day. They put off a tail and did some stuff. Um, you know, we're all thinking, hell, she's a great day in Kawara, for instance. Business is booming, there's people everywhere, but they were actually refugees from, from the planes that were running from running from a disaster that was impending. So I'm just saying that that's so important. But that that map is something we really need to need. The other thing I need to just ask, please, was that uh, if it's one, one colour suits suits everyone, and that's I think that's great because otherwise you will get have, we'll have confusion. Was we were talking about the size of uh, an event, and I think it was pretty different between a, a puddle coming your way or or a, a meter coming your way. That's what, what I'm just thinking. Is there a, is there a model on a, a, a certain height of a wave hitting? Um, so I'll go back to your first question first. Um, no, 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 absolutely. Um, so as the maps have been developed, we have a um, CDM group program meeting that runs quarterly uh, where all the local authorities, representatives, um, so those emergency management officers, come to that meeting and give feedback about the maps. And as they've been developed, they've had constant back and forward. So the maps have been closely developed with each um, coastal community. So Kodaki has been heavily involved in that too. Um, and we have been taking on that feedback around things like darkening where the coastline is to make it a bit clearer, the distinction. So these final maps that are coming out, it's still an opportunity if there's any last minute tweaks or anything to be built into that, and then they'll be signed off. Um, so that is going through each local authority. The second part about the size of the event, there is director guidelines on what the evacuation zones need to encompass. So we work off a maximum credible event. That's the largest 
event of a southern Kermadec trench um, earthquake, a 9.4, I think off the top of me, 9.2. Um, and that's a 14 metre wave at the coastline um, in different areas. That's, I, it might change along the coast, but yeah, around that. Um, and so that is what, it's a one in 2,500 year credible event. Um, and what actually exceeds that. So we're meeting those director guidelines, which is how we built these. So it's based off national guidance. So um, supplementary to you, I think it is important that, that territorials go back and, and start um, making sure that their staff are well versed with what's going on with Clinton staff. It's, they need to, so if, if we're gonna have this happen, it needs to happen tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, it just seems to be going on and on and on for the sake of getting it right. You're never going to get it perfectly right. Um, goodness gracious, 14 metre event. I wasn't expecting that. But, um. this, I guess at one point, um, these evacuation zones are essentially the same as we've had previously. Um, we've just done an interrogation of the data to make sure that we are using our best knowledge. Um, so there's very little changes across the board to what has already been out there, except for one zone approach. Uh, but that regional model that is being uh, in the process of being procured at the moment, that may bring changes, but that will be closely worked through as that develops. So there'll be opportunities as that goes on for local authorities to get up to date, to feedback data, to make sure that we're modeling it as best as possible for each community. Just to follow up um, from Councillor Campbell's, is there some sort of response that's required for Paura and Rotoro in terms of, I don't know, where does it fit in this? Is it sort of community engagement or what's, because it's not a normal civil defence response that would be required because the emergency is not in Rotoro or Paura. Mm -hmm. It's that we're receiving people mm -hmm. that have evacuated from another refugees. area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, your word, refugees. Yes. So where does that fit in this? Very yeah, I think and it's hundred percent. It's a really good uh, observation, but it's the it's similar to the previous one that in our response planning documents of how to respond and receive evacuate and receive, where we work with police and fire service and that because they normally do the evacuations. If we be bold in with your local controllers, Rotor and Carol would activate. I'll talk a bit about that in the cyclone response as well. They would activate. And they're planning, they won't have much communications to community because it's not a compact on community. Their, their communications will be all set and wide, kind of getting ready for receiving people. Um, so the mapping goes to coastal communities so they can evacuate themselves. Um, but the response planning documents that the controllers work on is how do the non impacted councils support those impacted councils? So that sits at that operational level um, when we do this planning. Just a supplementary uh, comment, and I know you made your recent before around the lakes. Uh, so we are investigating it. This is at the moment a program around uh, from coastal, but we are looking into the issue with lakes um, and finding up how do we investigate tsunami threats on lakes. So it will be a next stage piece that will affect the road road potentially. We'll come back with more. Thank you. Uh, Director Norbert, possibly just in addition to that conversation, when Kawira was a community of receiving uh, refugees or those who located uh, inland, there was a consideration of the communication we put out to your community, Deputy Mayor Kaipong, I absolutely agree with you, uh, which is what we found. There's just a lot of people hanging around in your community. And for those who live there, while we may not have that immediate urgency around a tsunami risk, it's just a whole lot of people that are there as strangers in the community. So I'll be my core function in terms of civil defence. There is also a conversation to be had and you're receiving it there and it's not twofold. It's the infrastructure needed as well as the conversation you have with essentially those in your community as well as your civil defence training staff become your high-quality homeowner, your look after people receiving them. And what surprised me the most was our uh, tsunami warning that the amount of people that came with their pets. 
they became really important to them, particularly for the widow. And Pitz is now their number one family member um, and just creating that on the run. We had a great response from our staff just on the run um, while still looking after people who really didn't know, not when they would go home, but they couldn't get their children to move on. Um, so just broadening that means we do have about relocating and evacuating. Councillor Kempton. Yeah, just, just one other thing too uh, that comes to mind is, is those emergency response people, police, fire and all the rest of it, they also have families. And that is a real concern about um, they need to make sure that they've got a plan to, um, uh, to be able to get a point to, for families to get to while they, they could be tied up in all sorts of things. I, 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 why? This come to my point. Um, the last time we had a, a bit of a shake in Wellington, um, I happened to be getting picked up by a, a cab driver, and he was telling me that they, they, him and his wife, for instance, both work in town in Wellington. And you imagine what Wellington's like when you want to get out of it in a, in a situation. They've got a plan. They've got a plan. And the amazing, silly, just a stupid thing that you might think, oh, that's that's a bit dumb. They've got bicycles stashed in the city that they. they and I mean, you know, you can get around on a bike. I'll tell you what, it's a hell of a way to run from the centre of town to Kandala. <laughs> uh, and you've got to know how to do that. So that's that's really important that people have a plan because a lot of a lot of people like yourselves as mayors and, and you know, you've got family and you've got to be thinking of your own family. So it's just a, a little thing that um yeah, we've we've got to take the responsibility of making sure that we are um but we've also got a responsibility for our staff and, and one big one. Council Brooks might be able to bring, bring the police one into it because I don't think there is one. I don't think we're cool one. Yeah. It just shows you that we've, yeah. we've got a pro problem straight away, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, they, they could be anywhere, especially here in the Bay of Plenty, in the Eastern Bay particularly. Um, you know, a lot of officers are, um, could be living in town here and, and working in a Poriki or Kawara or wherever. And um, all of a sudden, that, holy hell, wife and kids back at home and, and sitting on the lifestyle block in Thornton, for instance. And you know, it's just a, just a thing that we need to be really, really conscious of because that, then they become the weak link in the system. And weak links are going to be Thank you, Thank you, Councillor Campbell, and I see you. <laughs> 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 There's nothing further. Committee on Hedge to be we do the Received the report to approve the approach, currently taken and accepts the risk associated. If we have no further risks to add to our program, so we have moved the recommendation. Moved by Councillor Thank you, Chair. Moving on pages 44 to 48 of our agenda, item 7.7. Seven. Forgive me. I'm racing ahead, getting very excited near the end. <laughs> so we can turn to the second point six, the uh, Cyclone Gabrielle Disaster Relief Fund, Captain's Table. I'm sure most members should be familiar with this. There was a uh, chair wrote to our members advising that the government had given the Bay of Plenty $200,000 towards the disaster relief fund um, and that the uh, fund would be administrated initially by the joint committee and that invited member local authorities to apply for funding uh, from this fund. So that letters went out and at the time of uh, application closure, there was one application from Western Bay District Council. So the report is here outlining the fund and outlining the, uh, the letter from the National Agency Administrator with the fact that gives us a guideline criteria and the application 
which is better for this point. Can I ask you about the rectum or day, please, to review, just remind us of the key aspects in terms of application, what the uh, disaster relief plan is specifically for, and we know it's not going to get very long. And now I'll invite the worship meeting just to speak in the application. And just a reminder, this fund and clarified it with the National Agency was distributed to impact uh, regions or groups that were under the national state of emergency we were one of those during the event these funders ring fence to support those affected by cyclone gabriel so that was the first aspect um, and then the, that the fund is intended to support to meet the needs of affected individuals families community organizations marae etc um, as per the fact sheet um, so it's not meant to be used for council's administrative or business costs and is not meant to replace any other existing funding sources. So if there's already funds available from something, we're not meant to use this one for that. Again, examples on the fact sheet are like that. Um, and on page seven, where the fact sheet talks about the eligible things that could be, for example, meeting with septic tank overflows, filling water tanks, clearing debris from properties, uh, individual properties, supporting families with hardships, and, and there's a list there. Um, not covered is welfare costs that are because they already covered by uh, council can claim those back directly from the national agency infrastructure costs as the government has a scheme for supporting that insurance costs so anything that someone is insured and is paid by insurance then that's meant to be covered there and then other response costs which the government may fund 60% um, off and 40% by local authority um, the other key thing there is again, I've had a query around it includes out of scope and not eligible is operational costs of the council, so staff costs, that kind of thing, salary costs. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chair Tinui. So, um, I, I we in the Western Bay, we I don't want to first say that we weren't anywhere near as badly affected as so I love to and, and the Hawks Bay and, and so on. Um, but I think it is, was good that we were able to access this fund that was offered. And because there were pockets of quite severe damage, um, and I wouldn't want the fact that it is just those pockets of, of damage to um, take away the ability for those people to, to get the help. So I was, I was thankful that this, this um, opportunity was there. And I, Asked my uh, GM for infrastructure to come up with some, some ideas, which he has done so. And I'm happy to talk through some of those. The, the biggest ones are the um, debris and slash from the Ohina and Aina and a lot of the hurry streams, um, which washed through and uh, took out some beautiful orchards and, and just involved lots of slash. Just like Hawks Bay, but just on a slight smaller scale. And some of those people are hurting. They, they've got the um, huge log slime right there. Thank you. It's supposed to know what they can have to get rid of it and how, how they can pay for it. Um, yeah, I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks, So, the, the slash and the damage done to the kiwi fruit farms. They weren't able to apply for their own insurance or would it take too long and this was a, a good response to be able to use the fund. I understand at least some don't have insurance. Um, mm. Yeah, I, I, I don't want to get too much into, you know, what any particular farmer may or may not do. I, I know that I've had some fairly emotional people. So, you know, they've had quotes of $100,000 to remove the slash from their property. And, um, yeah, that's, that's pretty tough, I guess. Well, it's good that we're able to give them assistance, but I guess it's quite hard to 
um, do, do other kiwi fruit farm orchards. I mean, know that there was assistance given. Like, does it put council in an awkward position trying to choose who to help? There's a limited number because it needs to be orchards in a in a particular um, valley or two two valleys. So it's um, it's reasonably narrow. So it's quite confined. But the damage there is significant. But we're not talking hundreds uh, of hectares of orchards here. It's just it's quite it's quite narrow. Okay. Just a question, did you miss a one given that the criteria is that any money unspent must be returned? Yeah. 150. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, well, I mean, I think, um, I think Gary probably thought it was uh, unsavory to ask for the whole lot. Given that uh, uh, Western Bay was the only council affected, and um, thus we, we wouldn't then benefit of I mean, the Western Bay government. There was no further Yes, uh, through the chair. Uh, this system works different mm -hmm. to the reimbursement system where we spend and then try and get it back. The funds actually have already been given to us, so we, we have the 200,000 to disperse. Um, if, for example, this committee approved the 100,000 to Western Bay, and there were no other applications, we had no other need for it, then we. Yeah. 100,000 to Western Bay, the other 100,000 would have to be returned to government. So that's pretty much it is. Yeah, if we don't spend it equally, if Western Bay didn't spend their whole budget, we'd have to return what they didn't. There's a taxpayer that's an excellent way should be done. There was a need, and, and yeah, that's always a need. Yeah, yeah. only on the basis that. Um, so it was a bit wasted. Slightly lesser amount of support because it's not what you wanted to be fair, but. The only well, if the committee wants to, to allocate the whole lot to us, I'll be happy with that. <laughs> no, I was just careful because if, yeah, if there's anyone else, you know, any other district that um, that felt they needed it, then I wouldn't want to be you know, selfish. Yeah. 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 Following on the same line, so um, communication was sent to all the councils to identify if they needed to have anything. Bearing in mind that there's still 100,000 available, is it worth going back for a second, second ask? Yeah. And casting your eyes over what you can you can claim for and what you can't. We know that Waka Kotahi is a different situation because a lot of say, slips and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. I'd like to think we could give councils another go at see if they could claim it rather than it going back somewhere. Mm -hmm. Is there a timeline that it has to be utilised? Uh, through the chain, yes. there is a timeline. It's, it's months. Um, okay. Roughly, because after six months we have to compile a report back, so we simply would need to give us a uh, report of how the money was spent, and we'll consolidate that, send it to the national agency to justify the expend spending of taxpayer money. Um, but we still got time if the committee wishes to reconsider and, and still submit for the other balance. Otherwise, like I say, if it is nothing, then ethically we should be returning the money so it could be distributed to maybe the other regions or whatever um, but there is an option to reopen the application process all right thank you uh, i was just going to say um having seen western bay um seeking recompense for some of the marae that was stood up. I'm not sure whether we asked, I know we stood up three marae, maybe four marae. So um, I would like the opportunity to go back and make sure that um, that we've, we've actually covered any expenses and there may well be, I'm sure there may well be other councils. So I'd support going back to the councils now that we've seen Western Bay's, particularly having seen Western Bay and what we can actually um, seek recompense for, it would be worth another round, I think, rather than hand the money back without doing that. Thank you for that, Thank you for that Commissioner. Particularly the councils that declared, yeah. and we just invite you to return back, Councillor Brooks, Deputy Mayor, and then that was actually the three declarations in our Bay of Nancy region that triggered the Bay of Nancy declaration, and then we became part of the National Declaration. So we've gone from theoretically Essentially, talking about things to actually having a live run from local to regional to national all at the same time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Chair. Uh, fully support, and we're happy to, and we'll send out a reminder, you know, so that everyone's invited again. I will just encourage you, though, just to, if you're involved in this, and I will stress it to your staff, the staff are also asked to put forward their welfare claims, uh, because you some aspects, including Mariah, can be reimbursed under the welfare section. So we've just got to make sure we're not double dipping. Yeah, that's the main thing. So just if you're involved in this, and we'll stress it with your staff with their claim process, they can't claim it under the welfare reimbursement and then also claim it under the yeah. yeah. All you need to do is just deconflict. Yeah. Madam Chair, if I may, if I move recommendations one and two and add a third recommendation inviting other TLAs to be more than those to, um, to apply for the remaining funds. Thank you, Your Worship. Can I just, I have to just given that too, it is specifically for Western Bay that we have another committee member actually. I was just meaning that was supposed to say. Yeah, I wasn't, I'm not sure I'm yeah. so conflicted because I don't invest my community, but oh, yeah. if you want to. So, so I have a mover. Uh, Maybe the second. Recommendation one, two, and three. Thank you, Your Worship. Yeah. 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 Councillor Box. Second. Seconded. Deputy Mayor Kai Fong. Is that for the uh, figure amount that has been applied for Councillor Brooks? Good. Happy to second that. Deputy Mayor Kai Yes, very good. One, two, and three. Councillor Brooks, second, deputy Mayor Fong. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Aye again. Further, that should be safe for another round to those TLAs that um, declared. Just, uh, just to be aware that while individual councils were declaring, at the end of the day, the group declared for oh, everyone. Yes. That's right. And the national declared for everyone. So the reason we got the funding was because it was under the national. We don't need to. We don't need to. It's so all covered. For both needs to be. Your item 7.7 7, committee papers 44 to 48. Our side phone Gabrielle response. I've prepared a cyclone and Gabriel response, and I accept at the time of writing this, there's, there's a lot of questions and a lot of observations about learning and reviews. I'm not in a position to really significant reporting on that at this stage. So what other report is about is the facts of what happened and how we went through it, and then describing some of the next steps. So I'll take the report as read, but uh, we, our team have pulled together a it's called a GIS story map, just to tell a little bit of the visual story of what happened to us as we went through. And the focus is on the Bay of Plenty. So so, as you see up there, we all know that this was Cyclone Gabriel that came down from the, the tropics down to New Zealand. Um, it came through a Bay of Plenty. This has a lot of imagery, it's quite a picture. So, the story map just gives you an overview of what happened in, in a sort of factual, factual order. So I think I just want to set the scene though, because everyone is focused on Gabrielle, mm -hmm. but actually the, the event started to unfold on the 10th of January with Cyclone Hale. The Cyclone Hale started coming through first, as you can see in the picture there. Um, Track South, was quite a bit of widespread impacts on North Island. Most importantly, or most impacts were felt in Zarafati. So again, Bay of Plenty didn't get in the scale of things. We got minor impacts. But Rafati were impacted quite significantly through cyclone hail. Uh, so Rafati uh, declared a local state of emergency at 10 p.m. on the 10th of January um, because of the cyclone hail event. 
Um, and an interesting observation was there's a rainfall gauge uh, data just to take the picture from hail. If the community of the airport uh, logged that amount of rainfall, 250, you can see the historic comparisons. And then below that, there's some snapshot pictures of hails of Demat in Lisbon. A lot of those pictures became familiar scenes on our media, especially the slash um, from the forestry coming down. You know, it's quite interesting, I think, as any engineer will tell you, they build bridges to withstand, that goes over a river to withstand the water, but not when the water's bringing all that debris with it. So those are just some of the pictures that we started to see from hail. Um, and then what's important to know is that even though we weren't impacted, emergency management staff from the Bay of Plenty were already responding. So we were going to our neighbours, we deployed two teams. Uh, the first team went in on the 16th of January, with two of my staff, uh, Julia and Rowetti, who are all He was one of them leading that team. We also had a local recovery manager for Western Bay of Plenty District Council and Taranga City Council went down. Um, interesting, we took the opportunity, as we often do, when we're sending in a team to help, we try and use the opportunity for others to learn. So that team quickly found out that while they were there to learn, they actually got in boots and did a great, great fantastic job. The second deployment was a follow-up one with further two uh, staff from my department going back to support Tarafati. The main focus at that point was recovery. The response was pretty, to use the language, short and sharp, and it was recovery process. That we're involved in. That sort of merged into the 27th of January, fourth um, anniversary of flooding. And again, everyone saw that play out in the media predominantly how Auckland got uh, really slammed with the rainfalls. Mm -hmm. Some interesting, uh, a lot of you might have seen all this one on the thing the Auckland bus transport services keep going. Um, <laughs> So uh, the good diesel, that one. Yeah. <laughs> one of those electric things. <laughs> so a lot of, a lot of a good, it's a good illustration of how yeah, you were spoken to you bus were. Um, yeah, in the buses, etc. I don't know if WorkSack might be having a different view on this one. <laughs> <laughs> so that is just again when the when things hit fast, hit hard. That's what impacts are happening across uh, areas. Um, so that city council recorded its highest ever daily rainfall. Um, yeah, Auckland Airport, 245 millimeters fell when the historic rainfall average for them for January was 71.2. So they got really slammed with the amount of water that came down. States of emergency were declared in Auckland. 30 on the 27th, and also Waitoma District declared the following day on the 28th. And again, just some visuals of some of those impacts that happened in terms of flooding, slipping, slippages, etc. Um, again, we responded while we had some impacts in our region. We are already uh, was responding to help our Auckland counterparts and we switched from Tarafati now going north, and we had a deployment go up. Uh, over that time, we had five staff from my team, five New Zealand response team staff. So New Zealand response team, as a reminder, 16 is a volunteer group in Taranga, of volunteers who train up to go and do sort of large rescue and response capabilities. Uh, two Fakatani district council staff and one regional council staff member went out. So over that time period, we had a number of staff now working under the Auckland. Uh, again, big, it's totally lessons learned or observations rather. It's not yet learned. Responding to Tarafati is a big difference to responding to Auckland just because of the, the nature of the beast. Auckland is a metro, it's a, it's a city predominantly. So it is a different uh, way of doing things in each patch. Um, so, so as the weekend continued, there, though, we did feel rain at, uh, into the Bay of Plenty um, during that Auckland anniversary. This is a good overview drone footage of the train derailment that happened during that weekend.
Interesting enough, again, very, really good visual stuff for media. Media were all over this showing that. But in the scale of an emergency event, that is an incident that was being managed by Kiwi Rail, was being managed by uh, the local response. It didn't require significant responses to it because everyone was okay, the scene could be cordoned off. Um, and they had to, in that case, also involve uh, Ministry of Transport's investigation department because of the derailment. So there has to be an investigation first, and then the scene needs to be handed back to Kiwi Rail to then try and uh, or to clear up the derail trains. So while those was playing out in the media, you know, those kind of visuals, um, and some of these others we'll show you, which is the next one, which is the Taranga City Mangatapu. So if you watch the house with the red roof, and that's the before photo, and as I'm just across, yeah, what's happened once the lands have happened in the combat house. So the next is the, that property was pushed by the debris that came down, split in half, pushed onto the house next door, but then also blocked access to a number of houses around there. So again, a very localized incident in the scale of things to a few small houses. But again, for those people, that was an event. There was an event. Um, and full accolades to Taranga City Council, we got in there fast. The emergency department was there with the council uh, support staff, etc. They did a great job of managing that event. Everyone was uh, taken care of, looked after, seen cordoned, and work uh, was undertaken. Again, it was managed within council's response. So we do, we, one of the observations here, there still seems to be a, a sort of a misunderstanding that everything needs to be a state of emergency. A state of emergency is really <coughs> intended to give powers to your controller to do stuff. It's not, a, it's not required to get financial support. It's not required to do business. It's about emergency powers. And in this case, the city was well able to manage that event with its existing authorities and capabilities. Uh, another one that happened in that anniversary weekend was the number four road bridge in Western Bay of Plenty, a uh, picture that were, it was taken out, which linked 30 productive properties, predominantly kiwi fruit, um, but they were sort of cut off and mm -hmm. through the loss of that bridge. Mm -hmm. Again, the anniversary one, again, managed by the Western Bay Emergency Management Department and council staff, and working with those communities did not require state emergency or any special response. One thing I will just pause here and say, Cyclone Gabriel coming in over the top of this, the solution that NZTA and the council had worked on, which was getting a Bailey Bridge in, got impacted because of Hawke's Bay and those regions needing a Bailey Bridge. So there was a period where the Bailey Bridge was just stopped and it was through Western Bay and us working to advocate that we got the national agency to release the bridge back to Western Bay uh, during Cyclone Gabriel. So that has since been addressed. This is just a, a demographic of rainfall um, that was experienced over the region, but we have no the data that we have doesn't appear to have. This is shown for Eastern Bay. So that's just a, a highlight of where big patches of uh, flood inundation happened over the Auckland anniversary weekend. That's just the flood. There's not slips, roads, bridges, etc. So emergency main by plenty. We um, stopped on the ECC did act in support of the district council's emergency departments uh, in that anniversary weekend. But again, we didn't have to be there. We didn't, in most cases, councils didn't even activate the emergency centers, they did activate emergency management teams of councils. So the council got together and did it as a crisis, which in my mind was well uh, the correct way, and it showed that we are becoming quite resilient. So we are able to actually stand on our feet for a while before having to resort to emergency powers. But then the big one came. So once we've set the scene that we've already been through quite a bit, Cyclone Gabriel came over the top of that, and everyone knows how that came about. 
the one on the right, the yellow tracking, is all the modeling of which ones you can go. And uh, pretty much, Rust doesn't know which yellow line you can follow. <laughs> um, but the med service work on a number of modeling scenarios from that the closer the modeling comes together, the closer the certainty comes. So, as it says in February, the cyclone was positioned in Coral Sea, category three, uh, which is quite big, and coming heading for New Zealand. But at that time, the specifics were still unknown. It's still not 100% sure she was going to track. Um, and this, this uh, graph shows you where she went. So, coming in, as you can see, bouncing straight into the top there by Auckland, hitting uh, Northland, and then traveling off uh, east coast and out. So the top of the top theory modeling converged that Mesa is using the different models, solid to get more accurate picture. Uh, that Gabriel would travel through the layer painting. And um, those I think this paints a big picture. So net service really is and three warnings aren't given out likely. As you can see the picture that was being painted for the North Island in terms of red and orange warnings, which are the big ones. So we were all in the firing line in that. Specifically, the North and North Island East Coast. So, there's the satellite imagery um, on the 13th of February, the day when Gabriel had the greatest impact on the Bay of Plenty. But what's really interesting for me is if you look uh, where Bay of Plenty is. So where we sit there, this imagery shows as it plays over how we end up in the eye of the storm. So everyone keeps going, you look at a map now and you've got Northland was impacted, Auckland, Coromandel, sort of jumped us and then hit off at Sea Hawks Bay. It was because the way she flowed, we ended up in the eye and the, the force of it was hitting the neighbors. So at least, yes, it's absolutely all the time. Um, um, that's just the wave boy um, data from one of the, the wave boys just showing how the coastal, uh, the sea behaved, the coastal inundation, which was one of the major factors for us. So while others were getting slammed a lot with the winds and the rainfalls, a lot of our concerns started to become how the sea was behaving and how the coastal communities uh, were at risk. And that's just a, a, a snapshot of. Um, these are the points, yeah, for rainfall gauges on the 13th of February. So colors indicate how, in terms of the rainfall. So yellow is starting to get significant, orange, and then red. At the end of the day, compared to our neighbors, nothing, to be quite blunt, wasn't as bad as what, the, like we said, all been 245 miles. Just make additional comments. So, rural and provincial, it was there that there was one rain gauge that had 780 millimeters in a in a day or overnight. Mm -hmm. So that just gives some mm -hmm. a huge amount of rain. Yeah. 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 I think that just also my stress is we did we did we were fortunate. We were not impacted. We were impacted, but in the scale of things that kind of to our neighbours, we were. To use the language minor compared to this. Um, so that then on roughly three o'clock on the 14th of February, she was located north of, uh, north of East Cape. And that's just a satellite image showing the way you, know, you can see where the Bay of Plenty is, how we position it. You can see her sweeping down across Wellington in the south now. And then she tracked off down to the southeast. So going on to um, and again then from Cyclone Gabriel, he has just a, a indicator of foundation that came through. The previous one we showed you was anniversary weekend, and then this was Cyclone Gabriel's foundation. Very hot spots.
So on the 12th of February, the Emergency Coordination Center group that we, my staff and my group controllers uh, work from activated alongside Western Bay of District Council, Tarnava City Council, Tarnava and Podiki, so all the sort of coastal councils activated their centers with Rotorua Lakes and Powerall remaining in monitoring mode. So similar to what we talked earlier about ready to support, while they didn't actually activate, they, they, the controllers from Rotorua and Powerall were on all the briefings that were kept up to date, so they were ready to step in should they needed to. Um, we then went into a series of states of emergency being declared through this, and the timeline was as follows. On the 12th, he was approaching on the 13th, um, at 7.35, a Podiki District Council declared a state of emergency. At 3 in the afternoon, Fakatani followed and declared. At 19.38, Western Bay Anti District Council declared. And then at 2,800 hours, if they need to pay for the group, it's very evident that there was a lot going to go on. And then that was the 14th uh, of February when National stepped in and the Minister declared a national state of emergency to cover all the areas we were part of. So, again, just a reminder local state of emergency was superseded by Group One and turn is superseded by National. So, we then by that stage were operating under the National State of Emergency. On the 21st of February, that was extended because it's only valid for seven days. We were still under included in the extension. But on the 27th of February, they once again extended the state of emergency, but the Bay of Plenty was then removed. So we were no longer, we weren't deemed to be as infected. Uh, just a snapshot of staffing in the centers on the while well, we were activated. But you can just see for yourself the number of staff. And Cara on and Rotoro is shown as zeros because, like we said, they didn't actually activate, but their controllers and staff were engaged with us throughout. But the rest of the centers get staff working. Emergency mobile alerts, talking a bit about the, the communications count. We had uh, the group officers authorized to issue alerts through the emergency system. And three alerts were issued out in the evening to those locations Waihi Beach, Epic, two, Little Waihi, Epic, and that's because concerns were being raised around the behavior and inundation from the sea on those communities. So they were given notice to pay to move or move if they were felt feeling unsafe. On the point of evacuations, that was our focus to do at risk of vulnerable people across the And this was a massive combined effort. A number of Marai stood up as they do. Evacuation centers were set up by state defense uh, at different levels. But also community-led centers stood up. So community response teams have their own plans and they stood up their centers. So it was a massive effort across the region. Um, and people were, in many cases, were evacuated precautionary. So we wanted to get them and, and the message is, we want to move people out whilst daylight, while it's safe mm -hmm. to do so. It's safe for them and safe for our, our staff, the police, the fire service, etc. So the good news story again was all who had evacuated able to return home by end of play on the 15th. So a lot of people moved out. There were recons had to go back and, and houses had to be assessed and zone assessed, but everyone could safely return home. Another good one story that came out of was emergency communications throughout that event. Um, and Lisa is here and full credit to Lisa leading this charge. This was that joined up where Lisa uh, undertook to ensure that we were present about the response. And that, as you can see, are just snapshots. And if you can see some of the comments, um, I'm picking on the one on the right there. Uh, you're all stars. Thanks for keeping us updated. The next one, I have so much respect for you guys right there. All night long, I kept checking updates while reassuring my two year olds, like blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. So, and I want to stress this is but only one communication channel. Not yet, I know we're going to say not everyone's on social media. But it gets the word out and, and we have one of the strongest followings on social media and been recognized and commended by community groups the, the main thing was we were there we were with them and we were reassuring them we weren't just doing the government usual government you know, evacuate now lisa put a human spin on this and she was created that that people felt that we were sitting alongside them so i think that's huge and I'd like to commend Lisa on her work, um, supported by all other comms people, but that was a huge uh, success story. Uh, just some key issues that 
peaked for us. Peak of the event, there were over 6,500 customers without power. Uh, there were multiple communication outages uh, and multiple roads were closed. Interesting, some of them were still closed from the anniversary weekend. That's the key. They weren't actually closed because of Gabriel, they were already closed. Uh, so we still had those compounding. So there were, again, impacts. But a lot of these impacts were being managed by those businesses. The power companies had it in hand. I was going to go out, but they got it back on relatively quickly. NZTA and councils were onto the roads. We knew where the roads were. We were addressing it. Other regions, I'm not going to go into huge depth of there because there's a lot to learn out of that. Uh, but as of 3rd of March, a total of 31 CDM staff members deployed from us to support other regions. Yeah. And there's the deployments, Auckland, Tarafati, Wairo, Napier, Hastings, all had uh, staff coming from Hastings. So on the 15th, when we finally uh, switched off all our centres and, and uh, said we finished our response, the next day staff were in vehicles and heading out to help the neighbours. So again, this management staff were fully engaged throughout this event. And there have been ongoing deployments. Interesting observation during that is the national agency takes over the coordination role to move staff around the country. Very quickly, they agreed with the Bay of Plenty that we could put a product direct support to Gisborne in Wairua. So we didn't have to go through the national machine. We could work directly with them and our response teams. We took the pressure off the system by looking after those two, two uh, neighbours. What lessons will be going into the next event when it happens? I suppose. I haven't got the answer, but it speaks to the questions raised earlier. That's yes. our next step. That's what we're working on right now. Um, in that space, for example, each council's emergency operations centre controller and their staff are doing an internal debrief. What worked <coughs> for them or didn't work? They produce a post-event report, which they'll share with us. Once we've, and that's due in now by the 7th of April, we are commissioning uh, an independent review of the collective response. So we've asked for someone to come and have a look at how did we do it as a group. Again, that will be focused on our response. This is not about our neighbors, it's us. What worked, what didn't work. Um, yes, we can pat ourselves and ourselves on the back for some things, but for other things, we've got to go, well, we got lucky. Often we get lucky in these things. So that's those are the two steps there. The third debrief process we're involved in is then focusing on all of our staff who went all over the country, we debriefing them to have, what was that experience like? Were they, were they prepared for that? What was it like going into those regions? Because we're continuously building on our capability and making sure our staff were supported. And I can give you assurance that one of the things that we do in our region that I'm sure is not echoed in many regions, is that any staff member that goes from the Bay of Plenty, when I say any, it's not just my team, it's your staff as well. If they've put up their hand, they're going. They go through our centre. We have a, a designated deployment coordinator who then basically looks after them remotely. So they get a daily phone call from our deployment coordinator. Are you okay? How are you doing? Checking in with them. They get given contact details in our office for their family. So while they're away, if their family has a, a challenge, contact us, we'll help you while your members are away. So we put huge care into looking after our staff that are away as far as we can remotely. We do have a high level trust level in the receiving organization, the Forbes Bay Group, for example, to look after our people. But if they experience problems, they phone us directly and if needed, as I had to do on one occasion, then we will intercede and look and bring back our staff if need be. But all in all, the, the messages have been given. Calls I got, the emails I've got, that is the Bay of Plenty seen as a fantastic resource that came to help. Our staff across the board are seen as well trained. They bring calm to it, they bring stability to the responses. And then, sort of, uh, as like Campbell talked about earlier, you know, it's really hard to do an event if you're worried about your family. So you can imagine the, the people in Wairo and Gisborne are worried, trying to run an event and worrying about their own families. So when that outside help comes in, it helps to take the pressure off, it helps spread the load. So don't underestimate uh, the need to go and support others. But we will be bringing back further information or reports to the community on lessons learned 
And so what, so what are we gonna do there? But at this point, like I say, my team, last week was the first week I actually had most of all my team back again. So it's nice to actually, after two months, have a team that can get back to the business as usual work, which is of course includes lessons from your schools. And then the last picture there that we end with is the Wendy.com, uh, which just shows right now that's how the weather's behaving. You can see New Zealand in, in the centre. That didn't look so flash when I presented this to the Kuna executive group because then we had tropical cyclone Kevin and there were two of them. But there were two cyclones sitting out there and we were all getting nervous, another two are coming. Fortunately, they went off to the side. Um, so we, again, I don't know how we, New Zealand, would have coped with having another cyclone come over the top of that again. So we've had back-to-back -back events. We've been slammed quite a bit since well, the first part of this year. So that's that's the presentation. Um, I just want to highlight a piece around while the responses are over, everyone has gone to the recovery phase now. The key points there is the Bay of Plenty is not covered under the National Recovery Decision Notice. The government issued a national notice, which is similar to a state of emergency for recovery. Um, regions are under that, but not the Bay of Plenty. Again, we weren't deemed to be uh, impacted as significantly. Julian um, just come forward to everyone can see you. Oh. Know people. So Julian Ruetti is my principal advisor of recovery. Uh, he's well experienced in the recovery field. And Julian has been appointed the group recovery manager for Cyclone Gabriel. You might ask why if we're not under it, but that's because there are still implications for us. So Julian has sought after these on the deployments to property, these are deployments to Auckland. And he's been helping them with their recovery efforts. So Julian needs to be over stuff because he's not just working by himself, advising across. He's a well sought after resource with knowledge and expertise across uh, New Zealand at the moment. Um, so we're really fortunate to have someone of his caliber on our team. But Julian's also keeping an eye on things, what, like we said, lessons learned. Because in the recovery phase, you're still learning, you're still uncovering things. And Julian's keeping his eye on that to say, okay, so how can we adjust in the bay from those lessons? So I just wanted to introduce uh, Julian so you know that he's his role and he works with your local recovery managers from your classes. All of you have appointed recovery managers. Julian works with them to make sure we I'll stop there if there's any questions, observations. Committee. Thank you, Councillor. Oh, yeah, great presentation. Thank you so much to you and the team for your efforts. Um, and I think when the time comes when you go out to the A's to snapshot of that and just the table of all the support that the, the different councils in your team give to others. Um, I think that would add a lot of value to help them do their decision making because the intelligence that your own staff gather when they go out um, will all be utilised at some stage. You know, so yeah, well done. Thank you, Commissioner Tommy. Good to see you. Uh, thank, thank you, um, Chair. Look, I, two things. I just wanted to say thanks to Clinton and his team. Um, I think he's absolutely right about the media and the communications. Um, it, it certainly has been well received by the by the community and it just shows that keeping people informed and already um, others around the table have mentioned that today it's it's that good information to people um, that that really makes a difference even when things aren't grim just knowing that they aren't as bad as as you're hearing in the media uh, is very comforting second thing I just want to um, advise that, I have been appointed to um, Brian Roche's cyclone task force. Um, and so Clinton in particular, I'm happy to keep liaising with you as that um, unfolds. We've only had the first meeting this week uh, and it's going to be interesting. I think from a local government point of view, it is uh, being designed so that it 
um, works from the ground up, and we all we all know that local lo local decisions or local decision making is far more effective. But actually, we're dealing with uh, many communities who just don't have any resilience uh, left, and um, you know some of those small East Coast communities are. Uh, um, uh, getting their fifth and sixth hit uh, are beyond making um, good, um, reasonable decisions because they just haven't got any energy left and they're still digging out their own own properties. So it, it is going to be interesting and I'm sure that there's a lot uh, that we will learn that I'm happy to to share uh, with Clinton and, and, and your team. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, a brilliant, brilliant report. Um, thank you, Clinton. And um, but can I just remind everybody that how blessed we are in the eastern or in the Bay of Plenty region? Um, we ducked the bullet. We really did. Um, I have to say though, uh, the um, the long weekends was more a response from 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 this district more than anything because there was a lot of inundation that happened so the, the weather was the water was around before Gabriel hit um, uh, Rotomar Lake Rotomar well, anybody that's come past Rotomar in the last couple of days is, will see that there's the, the lake is well up and, 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 uh, and very active um, Regional Council went on a tour um, prior to December December and where we were parked in the bus is probably 18 inches of water right now. Um, Rota Airhu is in a similar situation with inundation there, with houses inundated. Um, so those are the sort of things that, are, that, that really do come home to us. But I just have to um, please flag something that Councillor Winters has asked me to bring onto the, um, to the, um, onto the table today. Uh, he visited Gisborne last week with uh, the CEO and the chair of regional council, um, and was pretty shocked for what he saw. wasn't wasn't all that surprised, but he was he was still pretty much overwhelming. He said, um, and one thing that um, was brought up, and, and Commissioner Tolly just thought it said about it, uh, the people at the East Cape. Um, didn't see a lot of stuff coming because evidently there's a bit of a black spot there from the weather radars from Mahia and from, from Mamaku. Um, and they were sort of a little bit in the dark, if you want to put it that way. Um, and he's just asked, he spoke to the, the mayor, Mayor Schultz, uh, Stoltz uh, at the time and mentioned the fact that it took a, it took a, um, a very vocal chair and, and a mural forum to, to get our weather radars set up in Mamaku. And that was probably one of the most the best investments we ever made at that particular time because it, we were always the radar was from Auckland and the, and the prior to that. So um, he's just asked, please, can we just table it at our meeting here today? That perhaps um, Mr. Stoltz will need some support from this area um, to do that. And there's a few rowdy mayors around the table here and a few rowdy deputy mayors. So. Good, that's what we want. Um, and the other thing that he brought up was a response vehicle. And I think, and I was just talking to Tom just a while ago about it, and, and it may be a little bit um, premature, but it's something that um, Clinton might be able to help out with in the, in the future. It's just, just that we were lucky we didn't need it here. But we probably, but it had it been a situation where we had to get power or water um, water purification or in the, into an area like, and I'm going back to 204 with um, Rotahuna and those sort of places. Um, those, the, you know, those those people are, are pretty amazing, but they, you know, they've got to be they've got to be looked after also. And and so I'm just just flagging that here, please, if I can. And uh, I think we probably need to bring Councillor Winters into the fold a little bit, but he couldn't be here today. Um, but he just would like to. Um, Particularly the weather radar, Hikarangi might be a good place. Pretty high point uh, on the Kaimana was uh, down down the uh, the uh, down the coast. So, um, but that's just something we may be able to just help them out with. But what a great what a great um, uh, response from the Bay of Plenty Regional uh, Coordinated Group. I have to say. 
just thank God we didn't have to have you use, use you here. That's all. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome home. Good to be home. So the in out helping with some of our uh, fun all across the water. Actually, when I read the papers, I'm sure it's good to hear from you. It's so nice to have you home. If there's any message that we have, actually talking about uh, learning. What I learned was actually this was the first of the year that I learned to be here today. Action table at Joint Committee. Start with us to see and appreciate the action that we're looking for to be reform us as we move into our government's roles. <coughs> Excuse me, about our mahi. So, we will of course, if there's anything you'd like to share with us, and that we sure will. Now, you've been up here, been working with people who've been looking at the many times of vulnerability. Yeah. Yeah. I'll be very brief and through the chair. <clears throat> with our neighbours, it has been a really big learning curve. They, they've they been in the game since at least 2021. So they've had red sticker properties since there and people living in garages since that time. So this is uh, Gabriel was a game changer mm -hmm. and uh, it's their fourth event. So uh, Clinton uh, and uh, Ben, who's their controller, have been working closely together for the past few years. But this has allowed, on my role, was helping them through transition to recovery to help how to set up what that looks like, where to get money from. Uh, and Gabriel's no different to that, except on a massive scale. There are a tremendous amount of learnings out of that, uh, not only from response, response transition, but then that really hard uh, matter of uh, where to from here. And uh, really clearly, councils uh, and regional councils, they're a unitary authority, are fundamentally closest to the, to the community. They know um, what's ahead of them and how difficult that will be. Um, and the task force that's been put in place have got a challenging task because most of the information they need comes from grassroots level. So we see a lot of uh, distress out there. Uh, but not only just people without homes anymore and the social impact that will create for the num next two, three, four years, but the sheer destruction to the economy. We're talking rural economy, farming economy, economy forestry and horticulture. That is absolutely substantive. So there are a lot of learnings to come, and I know Clinton will, will, uh, has been indicating that that's our next step because there are a lot of learnings we can transfer back to here, uh, very much so. Um, that's probably where I'll leave it at this point. Thank you, committee. We've had a number of uh, issues raised about not only what we'd like to improve in our community, but what we also not like to see, black spots, hidden places within our uh, we thank you for the presentation, Director Day. Any other recommendation to receive our report? Do I have a move, please? Moved, Councillor Brooks, seconded, Worship. Medina, all those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Those who are against, the items carried. Thank you so much. Thank you. Moving on to agenda item 7.8, the legal update. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, very briefly, most of the dominant stuff has been, I don't carry on all the little events, but I've just picked out a few highlighted points that I've got to remind the committee of um, that's still been happening over the recent times. And Communications and IT is a problem. Mm -hmm. Well, I think just emergency events. Uh, we talked about preceding ones, but then there was also one that came afterwards, and uh, I will invite me in here to add anything to this. But I found myself on a uh, Saturday morning on a national teleconference with national and agencies and that around Cyclone Gabriel to be interrupted to say, Clinton, what's going on in your patch tomatoes now? <laughs> it's just like, really, what's next? Um, so 
that was an interesting concept. They came in the tornado that hit, this talks about tornado or tornadoes. On the 25th of February in the morning at eight o'clock, impacts Y Beach. Roofs and walls were ripped off homes, power lines down, walls damaged, power outages to 2,487 properties when I looked at the power outage map in the morning. Um, so it came in short, sharp, hit the, end of the community there. But again, emergency services were on it. The local civil defense and major management team were on it. Council was on it. It was being, again, responded to and contained. I will say, sitting there on a national conference when, and they're getting so nervous because every time there's a blip, it seems like they start shaking um, to the point that I then got a call and said, the prime minister's going on air in 30 minutes. I need to give them an update. <laughs> it's just, it's happening. <laughs> so, um, but I think that's it. It just was another, just another event it sort of slipped under the radar, but it's not, in, again, insignificant for the community of Britain. If I can just add, so I, I understand there was just three or four tornadoes that came through. Um, and again, it's, it's the damage was, was very confined. Mm -hmm. So it would, you know, there were a number of roofs and houses which came off and they sort of went through power lines and onto, onto the house on the other side of the road. But so you're talking a handful of houses. For them, the impact was significant. For a person <laughs> under the road, or the dog, Brown, life is normal. So very, very, um, very, very confined. But the resilience in the community was, was just amazing. So it was eight o'clock or so that the tornadoes came through. I went down there about an hour and a half later. I got there. The contractors on the roofs rebuilding already. I mean, and the, the trees are already sawn up and down. So it was, it was just very quick. But again, that's the people sort of confined incident. So people can rally around because they're not being affected themselves. But yeah, tremendous resilience. Um, and actually, because, because the visuals, I, I did quite a few interviews on that because it was it was a newsworthy thing, even though the overall damage wasn't, wasn't so bad. Okay. Um, our next one is I'll just one more talk on each Thank you. All right. So the other one I just want to highlight is, is that it's all ongoing as I spoke to the people this morning. And they really work out this whole the hours of the morning, the 18th of March. And as I did in my update recently, we were showing that Jeanette had recorded by the 22nd of March, 922 crates have been recorded in that swarm. But there's a lot more now. Um, there's a lot going on. They are um, being small in terms of magnitude scale, but they are shallow and they are damaged. So they are being felt and they are having impacts. So that was another unique one where a lot of this was again going back to the reassurance mm -hmm. where we learned, and this is setting us up with national, where our long or strong get gone message, which is intended for coastal communities and tsunami zones. Now you have a community that we're going. For them, it feels long and strong. So I'm going, but where's going? Where's that now? Um, so we clear that you know you fall into this thing of everyone gets the message and realize the message is being taken out of context. Mm -hmm. But it's just the way the human behavior happens. So and if, and if anyone wants to add anything, that's the camera. Yeah, I've got to have. I've got to have a say here. <laughs> um, yeah, look, I think um, and the, the biggest issue for Tauro people was the fact that they were all going on onto uh, the GeoNet and it was reports of a weak, weak earthquakes and things like that. And I know uh, the next morning the CEO rang me and I wasn't in the best of moods, of course, because I'd had quite a bit of damage. Um, believe me, those were not weak earthquakes. They were weak in magnitude. But when they're two kilometres or three kilometres, that's down in our drill zone there, um, you know, and we've and so there's a whole lot of speculation and and of what's going on and who's doing what. Um, but that's a, that's the a third lot of swarms we've had since Christmas. The rest were all little little shakes, you know, and and, and you sort of you, you get to you get to live with them things. But um, this one was not 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 insignificant at all. 
um, and and quite a bit of damage around the place. You know, a lot of lot of internal damage, pantries flying open and stuff. But now that uh, and this is what happened in '87. Um, it's not until a month later or things like that. And after it, it's over in ten days with over a thousand and fifty earthquakes, um, and the magnitude up to four point nine, I think it was. Um, all of a sudden, damage is starting to show. Cracks are starting to show. Um, nerves are certainly starting to show. Um, but and full marks to the mayor. She's held it together, and you know she's at home with a, a young family, and they're all pretty much the same as everyone else in the town. But it's um, it was uh, yeah, it was pretty unsettling to be honest. And it's just that constant bang, bang, bang. And it's, goodness gracious, I I thought hell. Here we go, here we go. <laughs> um, but I, um, it, from a from a uh, an insurance point of view, and I'm just looking at my own personal self, and, and I've, I've registered everything, and I know that everybody else has registered, and, and sort of for obvious reasons, we're on the back burner, and that's fine. You don't have a problem with that. But um, it's just to make sure that, and I said that on national TV, to make sure you get your claims in, for goodness sake, because it is important that, that those sort of things are, you have an assessor come around and uh, if it's anything like 87, I'll tell you what, it was a bloody disaster. You, know, you get an overpaid assessor come in there and say, oh, no, nah, it's all good. And, and they walk off and you, you sort of sign, okay, give us give us the money, let's get on with it. Um, but in this case, there has been no assessor, no communication, which is a real a bit of a concern, but um, I can totally understand it. So the advice to anybody is to make sure you photograph everything, and I'm, you know you've got to get on with a lot, you've got to clean up stuff, and, and um, but quite a bit of st there's more subsidence than, than meets the eye. And I know the council and regional council are working closely to um, mitigate some issues there. Um, but yeah, other than that, it was yeah, pretty pretty frightening, um, and um, yeah, to be. Checking out of bed at 3 30 in the morning was not great. However, everybody came to the Campbell's house because I opened the bar and said, Well, let's get into it. Let's <laughs> um, that, that helped. But yeah, no, look, it's uh, it's it's um I think think people uh, and I've talked to people down and in, in, uh, on the plains, they were all all pretty much affected by it. It was, wasn't just in Kota at all. Um, and it's just the geo geology of the place. Um, but yeah. Was, uh, it's not nice. We had four shakes last night. You know, so it's still happening. And, and, and it seems to happen just as you doze off. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, so thanks for that anyway. But. Yeah, yeah. So look for, for those who live in Kawera, it is different for every family. Um, and I was interested... And Julian Ewitsi's view simply around the fact that if you were on or under the red line before any of this uh, event business started, you certainly felt more than vulnerable to things that are the red line. And ask that you have a discussion with Genius around this automated system of categorization of mild, unnoticeable, or whatever it is. Um, perhaps one in isolation. You have over a thousand of them. Can assure you it's certainly not mild and not used for often. Nothing more unsettling than having uh, the natural event because things out of the control. Um, but for some families that were here in 87, again, those really ingrained procedures of evacuation get sprung into action, like it was yesterday, but things have evolved and changed. So we'd be really leaning on our team to be able to communicate the different new ways that we respond to events and we also have a mill industry area where we do a risk of the chlorine levels which is the main concern that it may be and we were advised to go to higher ground hospitals but no one may be now again people just automatically tend into that and that's not the recommended, uh, recommended action either is standing on a doorway so that's important it's really embedded in our new setting and if it's shifted We've just got some work to do to be able to evolve into what the modern um, recommendations are. Because I know a lot of houses and houses in Pano who did stand on the door, and said that's not recommended. We've just got some work to do to bring us up and ask them that. We are graceful with people in times of panic, 
fear. We don't expect rational behaviour and thought. We both be willing gracefully go along with our fellow. And I want to follow on here. I give personal uh, compliments to the communications team at Envol. That's not our fault. We have to talk to Envol. <laughs> Director Clinton all day. Clinton and his team. But that very personal way we people. If you're in a household of one or one in a kit or some of the job, that personal style of uh, informing people does give a sense of you're not actually in the moment. Um, and that's why we say thank you for the very recent update. Just one comment, Chair. Yes. Um, and it's, yeah. it's just the, the power of young people today that understand things and read and, and don't just disregard stuff and it was got there's a little funny little thing that happened and I, I got I got two grandchildren and they live right next door to me and they were zoom, over to over to our place smartly. But after after about an hour or an hour and a half people start wanting to use the toilet. And my grandson he's 12 years old and he's a bit of a bit of a, a, a dweeb actually he's you know <laughs> sit there blonde hair glasses and and he says to everybody as they were using the toilet, whatever you do, don't flush. And everyone said, what? Because it might be the only water we're going to have for the next four days. <laughs> so that's just how they think, you know. And no, we, we, nobody was worrying about that before. <laughs> yeah, whatever you do, don't flush. Um, it was a bit different at 10 o'clock in the morning when he had a real good shake and he was sitting on the toilet. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's always a funny side of it, but by crikey. No, thanks, Chief. It's still my uh, update. Just the last main update is the primary work I've been trial. It's just so members are aware that criminal proceedings are, that WorkSafe are leading are scheduled to start on Monday, the 10th of July, and to go for 16 weeks. The court has determined the trial will be heard in Auckland, but they are considering providing a venue for a tiny for remote viewing uh, during that time. So we'll keep you updated, but that's just a on the radar that it's now coming to, to trial. And then the last thing I just, was more of a question. Um, we've been we trial Friday, uh, emergency management updates to this committee and others. I uh, just want to check in if that's of value. Is anything else you want to know about, but we're trying to keep it to those key high level points that are coming. A lot is happening because of the cyclones. I could see that dropping away, so don't expect big things all the time. As we settle down, there might be one or two things that we'll be sharing. We thought we'll give you a regular update every Friday on key things happening that week. Thank you, Chief. All right, thank you. Now I'm happy to move to a set of the local report segment by Mr. Anthony. Elizabeth, please say hi. Hi, hi. As against the item, Mr. Carey. Thank you. Moving along, we have. Written report, agenda item 7.9. Written report from NEMA from Lily Falls, our regional emergency management advisor from NEMA. I'll we'll take the report to you. Anything additional? Um, thank you. Uh, I'll take the report as read, and this update covers off a lot of the legislation about the new bill and its delays, etc. Uh, just the only thing to add is the severe weather emergency legislation bill that was passed. There's at the moment a uh, severe weather recovery legislation being considered. This week, submissions were called late Wednesday night uh, for, uh, sorry, Tuesday night, for Wednesday, and hearings are happening yesterday. And today, so I haven't got an update where that's landed, but that piece of legislation is specifically aimed at what was done in Christchurch and Kaikoura to allow the government to um, react and do recovery at a foster pace. So we'll get more updates when that becomes. Accepted or adopted. Thank you. I call for a mover to receive the report from Nima. Is Wisha here seeking the Council's call? I can't. I'm just going to. Councilor Campbell, all those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Those against, the item is carried. And we have had no further uh, items on our agenda, added to our agenda, just confirmation. Committee members that we will be distributing the acronym list, which will be a presentation yes. in and of itself, yes. I'm sure. Yes. <laughs> if we could have yes. one acronym yes. list for all of our ministries across the country, that would be incredible. Yes. 
Absolutely. Thank you for your bidding. Our date of our next meeting will be Friday the 30th of June.